So I've never seen The X-Files before. I wasn't even born yet when it first aired back in 1993. Today's the 30th anniversary of the pilot. All I knew about it before watching was the theme of the show. It was used in so many memes and other videos on YouTube and social media. And it was about aliens. That's pretty much all I knew. It went in super blind. Didn't know any of the main characters or the villains. There's 218 episodes, but there's also two movies and I wasn't going to include them in the ranking and maybe talk about it at the end originally. But upon further research, the two movies are canon and they're just longer versions of an episode. Episode. There is the Lone Gunman show which is also canon but I don't really care about it. I like them but I wouldn't want to watch a show or entire series about them. So with 218 episodes and 2 movies which makes a total of 220 entries, this is my ranking of every X-Files episode. Number 220 and 219, Nothing Important Happened Today 2 and Nothing Important Happened Today from Season 9, Episodes 2 and 1 after the finale of the 8th season. Mulder and Scola could have been left alone with William and had a normal and a happy life with Season 9 being with Agents Doggett and Reyes, which would have been really bold on the show's part to commit to that, but that didn't happen. Apparently, Mulder left because Scully told him so that he, Scully, and maybe William could be safe from whatever. The show now has to make excuses for Mulder not being there and bring in Scully for autopsy scenes and other things it could have been avoided so these two episodes and a lot of season 9 is trying to have its cake and eat it as well with two new leads and a sprinkle of the past because that's probably what a lot of fans wanted to see reyes could have done something a lot more interesting than what she was doing which was nothing or nothing i was interested in the fbi thing with kirsch of being a mole or against them was proven not to be true and was helping dog it and it turns out william may have powers because he's able to move an object undo everything at the end of season 8 trust no one once again going back to Mulder Scully is communicating with him through email and he might be in danger even though he's in hiding a stranger who turns out to be a super soldier wants to know where he is through lying about his life being in danger the super soldiers are cool anytime one is on screen I'm pretty much paying attention this causes Scully to panic because she doesn't know what the stranger wants until the end and she doesn't want to give out Mulder's location the entire episode is about that and I don't like it because it's a waste of time by this point I knew he wasn't gonna come back so just stop with the teases and move on just teasing Mulder may be in danger even though he's fine and won't come back and even if they kill him off screen it will be messed up just to treat him like that the one thing I do like is how the super soldier is defeated Scully, Reyes, and Dage are at the desert at one point or not the desert but there's just rocks and dirt everywhere and the super soldier gets pulled in due to the magnetite being there that's really the only effective way of getting rid of them for within, I didn't know that David Duchovny was leaving after season 7. So looking back on this episode, it feels like a waste of time because he's not coming back. Dog wants to find him and you see him getting tortured in a dark room. And anytime they go back to or mention him throughout season 8, it takes me out of it. This also means that the dynamic of the leads will change. Doggett is Scully's new partner. Luckily, they didn't have Doggett just be like Mulder. Doggett is a skeptic, which means that there won't be any of the fun back and forth banter that Mulder and Scully had. So a lot of the times it felt alright. Doggett is just doing his job, protecting Scully while Scully just has to be the one that sounds insane because of what she's been through. She's not believing everything now, but you can't have two characters that are skeptics because it would be really boring. And just as a tease, Mulder is holding a person hostage and Dage is there trying to stop him. Signs and Wonders is about the snake handling church cult. And I thought it was alright. Snakes aren't really scary to me, so whenever the leader was handling it and having chants and whatnot, I was like, okay. If you really don't like snakes, then this episode will probably be your worst nightmare. I do like them ending it with the guy still alive out there he's moved on he's still out there somewhere spreading his snake attributes somewhere else with the snake in his mouth not every case can be solved or helped by Mulder and scully sometimes the bad guy just gets away and they never ever come back space is about space and i thought it would be a much more interesting episode based on the fact that an astronaut in space is being possessed by spirit but i don't know for a lot of the episode i thought it was just really boring wasn't engaging at all Mulder having to see one of his childhood heroes being possessed was fun because of his reaction and the astronaut giving up his life for the mission was a way to explain the weird things that have been happening but this one just didn't click with me but nothing when the episode was done i was like okay and then moved on the jersey devil is a folklore around the jersey area and like with the most folklore there's a bunch of different versions of it it could have wings long legs and a long neck or have a deer face with wings but with no long legs or neck i find that concept of the jersey devil more interesting than actually appearing in this episode and honestly i kind of forgot about it until i looked back and was like oh yeah there's an episode about this this is also the first episode where Mulder and scully split up and see what their lives are like from work for Mulder, it doesn't really change he solo hunts the jersey devil because he has nothing else in his life he's all in on finding the truth about his sister but also on every 
everything else, Scully has a life or seems to want a life outside of the X-Files and goes on a boring date but doesn't realize that this job will be a big part of her life for about 11 years. Part did not help me remember the episode so it's forgettable. My struggle has Mulder and Scully coming back to the X-Files. After 14 years, Joel McHale calls for them because he thinks that all the alien stuff that the syndicate was trying to keep a secret and experiments were all just hoaxes and the real reason is to control all of America and that I don't like. It's asking me to believe that everything Mulder wanted to believe in the previous 9 seasons just had nothing to do with aliens and it would have been really stupid if it was that. Throwing out 9 seasons and 2 movies of lore. The Smoky Man is also back which shouldn't be a surprise, he just doesn't want to die for some reason. That's also an issue because I like him a lot and is probably the best character on the show. It also means that stakes are pretty much gone. You know he's gonna get out somehow. Whether it makes sense or not, other than that, it is cool just seeing them back a lot older. Both were probably just chilling for 14 years and then we're back. Are they a bit stiff? Sure. But you know what? Who cares? The most exciting part for I'm assuming a lot of the fans were seeing them back together and having that banter with each other again years later. Scully begins to worry about her pregnancy in Per Magnum because several women had no way of naturally being pregnant. It was only when they were abducted and then impregnated with alien babies. Scully obviously was just pregnant at the end of season 7 and I had no idea how she got pregnant. Her and Mulder weren't doing anything together near the end. So what caused her pregnancy and why did it take so long after her abduction for it to finally pop up? In a flashback, Scully asked Mulder to be a donor and he agrees. And then even later on and further in another flashback, her temp and fertilization but Mulder says to never give up on a miracle and it turns out a miracle did happen. Scully doesn't have to worry about whether or not her kid is an alien or not. I remember thinking before watching this episode like are they gonna explain how she's even pregnant? Because that's 13 episodes in this season already and luckily they do. Turns out Mulder holding a hostage and without was a super soldier. This is Daga's first attempt to explain after quote unquote Mulder fell off and just got up from a big ass fall from a cliff. Scully and Skinner are the ones that know what's really going on but Daga keeps questioning if Scully and Skinner are smoking crack and has to report back to Kirsch, who isn't the most thrilled about the alien stuff, which is why he has Doggett assigned to the X-Files with Scully as a way for some sanity or something to make sense when he gets a report. Again, the dynamic would change with Doggett doing his job, Scully seeming like the one who's gone crazy on the aliens and theories. And then of course, as bait, there's a scene of Mulder still getting tortured by bounty hunters, probably sticking some things into him and maybe turning him into a super soldier like Billy Miles. Number 210, Patience from Season 8, Episode 3. This is Doggett's first case on the X-Files and it will go the way that you would expect it. Doggett thinks there's no way a bat-like creature is out there. While Scully isn't convinced as well, she throws out theories here and there, which Doggett thinks most of it, if not all, are ridiculous. To be honest, I don't even care or remember this bat creature. I remember more of the different investigating techniques that they both use and it's a lot of that. Over time, it's just, again, okay. Doggett doesn't want to believe. And throughout his run on the show, he never believes at all. And it would have been very interesting if at some point he was a believer as each episode went along but that's also who Scully would become. You can't completely copy and paste what they did with Scully to Doggett and then you also can't have Doggett also be a Mulder clone. He's gotta be his own character so they're in a bit of a corner when it comes to Doggett to make him stand out other than he was in the second Terminator movie. At least they have one thing in common which is that they are too afraid to believe. Jump the shark is where the lone gunmen get killed off. All three got caught with the virus and I felt nothing when they died. Don't love them. Anytime they pop up on an episode, they're a lot of fun but I don't feel the need to watch their show. Mulder not being there doesn't really feel right. Granted, he couldn't be there and would later be wrecked in the revival season as watching the funeral from a distance but Mulder not going up to the grave or thanking them for always being there for him would have been really nice in some way. Maybe just show a dark shadow watching from real far because he's out there just hiding from super soldiers and the government it just makes sense that Mulder first met them and would be there for them at the end. I really like the creature in the gift. It's a soul eater that eats the soul of a human and it's able to save Doggett's life by eating his death. However, this episode is also bait as Mulder is back as a flashback, which isn't as bad as seeing him getting tortured and then not going back to it for episodes. I wouldn't be shocked if the trailers for this and episodes that have Mulder in it in season 8 teases Mulder coming back as the big selling point to get people to watch, only for him to be in like a flashback or 5 minutes. It's also revealed that before he got taken away, Mulder had a brain disease due to being exposed to an alien artifact in a flashback back which i guess they're going back to when he had that mental issue or not mental issue i guess that's what they're talking about that's what i first thought but then there's a flashback scene in this episode i guess it's a new place that he went to and i like that Daga has a question what happened and doesn't know what to write on his report he doesn't want to have the reputation that Mulder had but doesn't want to lie about what he went through but doesn't write anything because skinner tells him that it would contradict Mulder reported before he was abducted and try to help a family with the soul eater 
Agents Miller and Einstein were okay in Babylon. This feels like the show's attempt to maybe continue the show with them or have another spinoff. The issue is that they're clones of Mulder and Scully. Miller is the one that wants to believe while Einstein is a skeptic. It's just too on the nose and feels lazy. Mulder calls for Einstein while Scully calls for Miller as both need their help and it's kind of fun seeing the banter with each other but felt more like a test to see whether people would like them if they were separated and with familiar faces. And I'll be honest, I forgot about what all four characters were doing or trying to prevent. Was he even a creature? I think it was... Oh no, wait, never mind. It was about the suicide bombers. Because the cold opening was probably the best part. It opens with a guy making breakfast, meeting a friend, and I'm thinking something's bad gonna happen to them. But they go into a store and there's an explosion. Did not expect it to go the way that it did at all. A fan shows up in alone. Her name is Lila Harrison and my initial reaction was, oh no, is she gonna be annoying? But luckily she's just okay. She's not overbearing or freaking out over everything like being in the X-Files office or her mentioning Mulder and Scully a lot to Doggett. The placement of this episode is probably the biggest issue. It's in between the Black Oil episode with Mulder and Doggett and the two-part finale. It should have been before episode 17 after Mulder comes back and has to save Doggett and Harrison. At first Mulder and Doggett don't really get along with each other and then Mulder can save Doggett while also also bring the rules set by Kirsch, causing him to be fired and letting him be free and live, not having to worry about theories and the FBI, he can have a normal life that the Spoken Man showed them back in the beginning of season 7. In Dead Alive, Mulder is back. After his body is found, he gets buried which is 100% believable. At the same time, Billy Miles revives himself which causes a closer examination to Mulder's body and through whatever means, he's back. To me, it really didn't matter how he came back. It was like, okay, he's gonna come back. Okay, he's coming back. So those torture scenes were completely useless but it still felt like bait to keep interest because he was such an important part of the show. Cryjack has a wild journey throughout the show. Works for the syndicate, then gets betrayed, wanna expose them, gets stuck in Russia and tortured, has the black oil within him, him, works for the syndicate again like he's gone through a lot he decides to infect skinner with nanobots as leverage for him to kill william because super soldiers are coming after him why the hell would crajack side with them i guess for survival he figures that humanity would not survive as the syndicate is also dead he has no allies not even marita there's no save room or anything like that and just has himself never felt bad for him because he was always a snake my struggle for is the second series finale and it was all right the spoken man coming back again felt super redundant but him dying again is also like i guess he's coming back again somehow ray is dying and her appearance in this felt shoehorn in because there needed to be a familiar face with the smoky man and i guess reyes was just available she's kind of on his side for survival and gives out info for scully she could have had an arc i don't remember her having an arc at all in season nine or maybe i just forgot that's also another possibility i just forgot because it was just so uninteresting or just forgettable Skinner getting crushed by the car and dying, sure. If there was another season, all of these characters that died would have probably came back in some way. A lot of this episode is fast paced and things are moving really fast due to William being on the run. William gets shot by the Smoky Men, disguised as Mulder but then is shown to be fine later on and then Mulder and Scully are left alone, thinking Williams is dead and has to let go. I don't know whether it's just me not caring by the time I got here because of the redundancy or the episode itself was just whatever. Set up things for the future that will probably never happen. The Truth 2 and 1 from Season 9, which were the original finale of the series, is a slightly better ending. William is no longer in the picture. Mother is now on the run because he killed a person from the government who was a super soldier. It was cool seeing Marita, Cryjack, and Mother's head and Gibson coming back to back him up in prison court. And the truth isn't out there, which is the right call. The truth about aliens, super soldiers, and creatures would have probably freaked out the entire world. And Mother still wants to reveal the truth even after this finale. Still has something to do and chase. And Scott will be right there with them every time. I did not like the smoking man coming back with his long ass hair. One, he's back because he's unstoppable and two, he dies again with a ridiculous ass look. He was either behind everything or you know what I pretty much checked out when he was on screen again because like damn really him again? Like a cockroach. Dog and Rias just leave as well. They drive off and let Mulder and Scully do what they gotta do. Black Luster finale. My struggle too. Reyes decides to help out the Smoky Man because she gets immunity from the pandemic which pretty much predicted COVID two years later. Again, that's what Reyes is doing in this finale and the rest of season 11. But she does intend to stop his plan by getting info to Scully and being the mole. So at least she's not evil or sided with him without any reason. And if you were to find out, then she'll likely die like Bender and Diana did. Seeing everyone freak out, getting sick and not acting rational is something that would happen within the show in a real life. Scully's fine because of her DNA. It would create a vaccine for the 
brother of ours because of reasons I forgot about. I'm just gonna say she got abducted and her DNA changed. The Smokeman is also able to give Mulder a villain speech before Mulder starts getting sick, just saying that no one or anything will ever get rid of him. And as a cliffhanger, a UFO light shines onto Miller and Scully, maybe insinuating that Scully will be the only survivor and has uses for her, but that would not be the case when season 11 premiered. It's chaotic, which was the point of it. Reyes is back, Smokeman is back, a virus, everyone's dying to see a UFO. Number 200, Fresh Bones from Season 2, Episode 15. The only thing I remembered about this episode was at the end where a voodoo spell is put on Mulder and Scully and Maggot starts coming out from the scar on her hand and Mulder has a heart attack, I think. Rewatch the episode and yeah, it's okay. Mulder believes that revenants are occurring because a Marine Corps member shows up on the street when Mulder and Scully were driving. The Colonel isn't the best person because there were complaints about him by some of the Marines and he's the only one performing the voodoo spells and bringing back the dead, which is why his punishment being buried alive in the end was perfect and the boy that they came across was already dead six weeks ago meaning that they were interacting with the ghost i guess he just stuck around long enough to get one last free meal for molder Tessa dos Beachos is where a bunch of animals start attacking and killing people for seemingly no reason, but of course, there has to be because Mulder always has one and suspects that since the burial urn was removed against the wishes of Ecuadorian tribespeople, which is why rats are crawling out of toilets and a jaguar spirit starts killing people, just don't touch things that aren't yours and leave them be. Rats being able to pop up from your toilet is a scary thought and scenario that I don't ever want to be in. Just imagine yourself sitting down and then rats start biting your ass and crawling out and then I don't really care about the characters that show up here, nor do I even remember their names. Animals killing because they want to be left alone is enough for me. Mulder and Scully go into the forest due to a bunch of people being killed. They are accompanied by two other people and they meet another at a cabin. One by one they start disappearing and then dying. Some of them blame an invisible force that's killing them or is it a swarm of insects that causes the death? At the center of all of this is the eco-terrorism that's going on. Some people want the forest gone because some truly believe that insects are killing people or some use that as a fuel to convince themselves. Just let nature be. It's been doing fine without humans trying to destroy or change it. In the end, Mulder and Scully don't find the other that went missing and there's pesticides to get rid of the insects from the forest but Mulder suggests that it won't work because these insects are a beast of their own and won't let anyone destroy the forest. The Lost Art of Forehead Sweat is an episode about the Mandela Effect. It's a self-parody. What if a guy named Reggie, who was in the opening, was there the entire time with Mulder and Scully? They rotoscope him into scenes of the previous seasons, which is fun, but the Mandela Effect is something that I don't really believe in. There's one where Kara's George has a tail and not one, and I watched the show growing up, and he had no tail. Unless it's from an earlier run of the show, or they added it later on, then this is just made up. A lot of the time, I do think most of it's either people forgetting what they saw, or something was just made up. He seems to have made for the fact that he was always on the X-Files, hunting and searching with Mulder and Scully, even though there's 10 seasons of evidence that he was never there, you can make something up and some people will just believe it. Fight Club is an episode about twins and it's kind of weird. There's two people that have twins and it's an intermingly confusing thing with them and with Scully and Mulder as well. They think it's just two sisters and then at the end it turns out the guy they both love also has a twin and somehow all four were separated at birth. This causes job issues as they have to move around a lot bad because it means that they're not committed to one job and then they leave after a month or even weeks. One seems to be good and the other bad but all four were somewhat the same with different interests. Nothing ever really it happens at the end they just have to be separated and let everyone know that they have a twin the look that Scully gave at the wrestling event was my reaction for this episode like what the hell is going on i guess the one cool thing was rvd being in the episode wrestling one of the twins William is in danger once again and Providence, someone or something wants to kill him again and again. It gets very tiresome over time. He's essentially a plot device which is why I preferred the end to season 8 as it wouldn't have to deal with William, Scully, and Mulder. And it makes any episode dealing with this boring and predictable. They're not gonna kill off a baby on TV. Would it be bold but also kinda messed up? I don't think people really wanna see that. Another artifact shows up which means that there's another ship around. It somehow leads to certain people wanting to kidnap William as they see him as a sacrifice to the ship, some weird cult reason to convince themselves that what they're doing is good. But whenever William is in danger or if there's any stressful happening, Gillian Anderson does a really good job at showing that she's willing to do anything to protect him. So even if I'm not on board with the story, at least there's a really good performance from her. 
I thought the season 7 premiere was a bit boring and slow. Mulder is still dealing with a headache and is in bed at the hospital. Clearly David had time off and there needed to be a story reason for his absence. Agent Diana is siding with the smoking man because he needs someone on his side that most people will know and Diana is that person. I'm just shocked every time someone sides with him. Claims to give the person immunity and safety even though time and time again it never really works out. Scully's research on the artifact was not really intriguing at all. Narrates a bit, runs into some trouble with the locals but nothing exciting. The opener to the season isn't this exciting look to see what would be the overarching narrative. It's the second part of a three-part episode run, so it kind of has to be the breathing room episode where nothing significant happens. The first and last episodes will always be more important. Quagmire is about a big blue creature in the water. This is their take on the Loch Ness Monster that may or may not be true. Mulder is set on believing that this is a water creature that's killing people and Scully of course thinks he's insane. Mulder would be disappointed because the killer turns out to be an alligator. The show does waver on whether you want to believe it or not. Not. I was initially disappointed that an alligator was killing but it ends with the big blue still out there in the water. Big blue is real but the rest of the people would not think that it is real which is fine because sometimes the truth can't always be out there so whether you are a believer or not you're satisfied with most of the outcomes. The show doesn't just write for one side it tries to explain why Scully was right in believing that it was an ordinary animal attack while giving Mulder some credence so that he's not just making stuff up because it would have been very disappointing and very stupid if Mulder was just making things up on the spot. It's very very wet in Aguamala. Mulder and Scully not only have to deal with weather, but an octopus that only shows its tentacles because of budget reasons. The officers and a lot of people in this episode are from Florida, and at one point either Mulder or Scully said something about Florida people being weird or crazy. I thought the whole people from Florida are crazy just started 10 or so years ago, but it also looks like even back in 1999 when this aired, there were already jokes about it. Social media sometimes just shows the worst of humanity based off of what I've seen. Florida seems to be the state when a lot of shit happens, but that's not true, it's all around the world. I forgot most of the people that were in the apartment hiding from the octopus. The only characters I remember were the couple whose wife had to give labor in the episode and Scully had to deliver it, and the officer that first met Mulder and Scully who was so dumb and bad at his job that he was the most memorable character. They didn't really feel anything about the octopus tentacle monster because the tone of the episode was much more comedic than being scared of the tentacles. Sure Kill tells the story of two brothers and one of them, Randall, has supervision like Superman, which helps his brother Dwight get away from crimes. He can see through multiple walls, which helps him shoot people and mimic what a person says when he gets interviewed later on. However, their team up would derail because Tammy, who is Dwight's girlfriend, doesn't really like the way that he's treating her. Dwight treats her horribly and Randall has a crush on her, so both intend to run away together and leave him. Because he's really using them both, Dwight suspects that there's something going on. Jealousy and a bit of misinterpretation leads to Dwight holding a gun to her head and wants Randall to kill her as he still has use of Randall's abilities. But that would be a mistake because Randall decides to get rid of his own brother to free not only himself but Tammy as well from him. Allows her to run away while Randall pays a price for Dwight and the other murders. Number 190, Providence from Season 9, Episode 10. Second part to the group that wants to sacrifice William and it turns out that the group was a UFO cult. They think that William will be the savior of the world. The UFO cult thing I like but what's surrounding it is what I'm indifferent about. Mulder is quote unquote dead. Every time the show does this, it doesn't work. It's more annoying every time they tease or mention Mulder. And then Scully has to take things into her own hands because we are and no one else could really help, which also means that it's very boring. Mulder dying was just a lie. William is fine in the end, which means this was a complete waste of time. The season 3 opener wasn't a very exciting way to open the season. Mulder is still recovering from the explosion that the Spoken Man asked for and gets help Navajo people in the area and takes care of him until he wakes up. Scully meanwhile is trying to figure out what the hell is in her neck. She figures something isn't right when she passes through a metal detector. The metal being in her neck will be an important part in her abduction and lead to her cancer storyline in season 4. This episode also has the same issue with season 7 being the middle and second part of a 3 part episode. A lot of it is downtime especially when it comes back to Mulder laying down while there's chance or something like that. Like okay he's gonna be fine, let's move on. He'll be up at the end of this episode or the next, just buying time for what's gonna happen next. The only thing I remember about Daemonicus is the title itself, the upside down E next to a normal E or maybe it means something else in another language, maybe a demon based off of what this episode was. James Remar throwing up on Dog it was really well done. Even with episodes that I don't like, they have good practical effects. James Remar set up this game in order to get out of the asylum and he got away with it. The entire demon thing was just get the X-Files involved and have Dog question his own skepticism and use the murders as a way to find a way out. Reyes does truly believe that there was a demon entity involved in 
some way. Dog, of course, is like, there's nothing demonic about it, but there is this slight worry to him because he felt too something was off, sort of admitting it, but also not full on wanting to believe. This is not happening just lightly makes it being a good episode. Once again, dealing with Motor. The only difference is that he actually shows up dead. So there's no more flashbacks or torture scenes. No more teasing fans of Motor being in an episode and then going away. Never to be seen for the next couple of episodes. The two things that saves this episode is the introduction of Monica Reyes. The nice addition to the cast. And at the end when Scully cannot face the fact that Motor is actually dead. And she goes into the house and yells this is not happening. That pretty much saved it for me. It seemed like a meta end because there's no way they tease Mulder throughout the entire season and they only have him killed off whenever he gets back. It would have been a really bad joke if the show just committed to that. You're never getting him ever again. Home Again is about the Band-Aid Nose Man. Don't have much to say about this other than it was cool seeing him rip people apart like it's nothing. Every single time he kills it looks cool. Kind of like a Mortal Kombat fatality. Picks them up and rips them apart because people want to buy property where a lot of the homeless people live. Wanting his territory to be kept from being bought out. And then while all this is happening, Scully's mother passes away. That's my main issue with the episode. These two stories could have been separate episodes. But since season 10 is only 6 episodes, just throw a lot in it. It cuts back and forth between these two and it's clashing with each other. Ripping people and then cutting to Scully being emotionally wrecked. The call between the mom and her younger brother Charlie was nice but then it ties back to William with the mom saying my son is William. What I prefer to feel is left as a moment with Charlie, Scully, and her mom and not have to tie it back to William but I guess Chris Carter wanted to bring him back in some way. The season 11 premiere was this fast paced episode full of major plot twists. The finale to season 10 was a vision that Scully had. Not completely throwing out the end. Both William and Scully have the same visions which makes them telekinetically connected. Mulder meets former syndicate members who oppose the Spokeman's spreading of the pandemic to the entire world and want to colonize space. And the biggest being that the Spokeman impregnated Scully back in season 7 when they were on the road trip which was weird and he totally drugged and used her. So that was disgusting to hear. He even said in that episode that he was very lonely and I guess took a liking to Scully but at that point I didn't think he would impregnate her. It was a better opener than season 10 which hard sell for aliens being a hoax. This one is fast paced and gives major info as to what season 11 will be about. The cool part about going back and watching older shows is that you might see some familiar faces that will later on be a star. Jack Black, he and his friend are at the arcades and someone decides to piss off Darren and he kills that guy that decided to piss him off in the first place. Darren has these abilities, is socially awkward and is in love with an older lady. If he doesn't get what he wants, then he'll forcefully get what he wants. He can take a hit from a lightning bolt, which still looks good. Darren gets a sheriff in a car accident in order to make a move on Sharon. Sharon knows that he has a crush on her but just brushed it off as a kid with lust. Darren even killed Jack Black for ratting him out even though he didn't. Darren just sucks that line or at this point doesn't care anymore. He gets another lightning bolt to strike him and knocks him out leaving him in a room changing the TV channels. What he wanted was a fantasy which a lot of the times don't come true. Three Words was kind of a way to write off Mulder as a series regular or from ever coming back which was the case until the season 9 finale. He has to do his own research that involves a guy going to the White House to warn the president alien invasion. The end result is once again unsolved and unsatisfying. Mulder gets caught by the black ops and then the next episode would officially have him leave the x-files and get fired by season 8 i was getting tired of the alien stuff Mulder has a lead and then it's covered up or no one believes him at all it starts getting really old really quick you just can't keep doing that for the plot for eight seasons started enjoying the monster of the week episodes a lot more because they were having fun all Things was an episode that Gillian Anderson directed and I liked it. The one thing that kept taking me out of it was the music. The music choices for this one was kind of weird. Scully meets a former partner of hers, Dr. Watterson, and spends the time to reflect the past and what ifs. Then they didn't want Scully to go to the FBI for a thing and she could have been in the medical field. Her seeking out other options to help him out with his heart condition may seem not a character but it was someone who she cared about and puts her skepticism aside to help out after all these years still wants a relationship with her but she's no longer the same person she once was. I think she's happy with where she's at with her life. Meeting Watterson was a way to resolve anything that was left with them and move on and we confirmed that she made the right call to go work for the FBI. Fearful Symmetry was the one about invisible animals and Sophie the gorilla. Brings up whether we should be messing with nature or the natural order and absolutely not. We should just let things be and try not to alter nature or let nature do its thing but there's just some people that cannot leave things alone and feel they need to touch everything or make things better. As much as I like the Sophie storyline which was nice because she just wants to protect her baby and her dying at the end was really sad. It's also a gorilla running around and at any time can fuck you up. The only part that I didn't like was the UFO connections. Could have been a standard 
standalone episode about messing with nature and of course has to tie back to aliens there are bright lights that take people and it's like nah just have it be this other story and leave the alien connections out of it number 180 teleco from season 4 episode 3 the thing i will remember about this episode is seeing african people getting their skin color sucked out from them visually it's drawing to look at and plays into the fear of the unknown or xenophobia the reason why people are afraid of aliens is the fact that they look different and probably have technology that's better than humans it's so foreign and strange to all humans that they'd rather get rid of it teleco folklore i thought was a bit boring the only reason it's killing is for survival and has been doing it for that reason for a very long time and then marita appears which is her second or third time she's appeared it's early on and she meets with Mother. she'll be a reoccurring ally to Mother and scully but then you know she turns out to be working with the syndicate everybody that Mother meets about conspiracy somehow ends up working for the smoking man or the syndicate cockroaches are bad and will likely kill you is the entire premise of war of the copperfidges this is a much better episode about bugs the one on supernatural was all right there weren't any glaring cgi bugs whenever the cockroaches were killing it was pretty damn brutal wasn't scared though bugs aren't scary to me and bambi Mother's scenes with her were a lot of fun when he tells scully this isn't a good time right now he may or may not have a good or when scully hears her name for the first time it's like bambi what the hell kind of name is that having these fun moments helped the episode because cockroaches as a premise and a threat seemed ridiculous and not taking it too seriously was the way to go. Badla is the beggar who begs for money and has another motive. He gets inside of a person and then essentially gets born again through another person and is able to look like that person that he's taken over. This puts Scully to the test. She has to be the one that's kind of a believer in season 8 and thinks about Mulder, thinks about what Mulder would have done or thought about during this case. And then when the beggar disguises himself as a kid, Scully has a hard time pulling the trigger because all she sees is a kid and all she's thinking about is that she might be killing a kid it might be a mistake even though the kid who's being bullied can see the beggar the kid getting bullied and how that comes around i didn't care for the beggar jumping through different bodies was way more interesting than the bullying stuff and because he doesn't seem like a threat he can beg and then if you don't give nothing then he just moves on you're not expecting him to come up and get inside of you and take over the opening to Lord of the Flies was a parody of Jackass. Aaron Paul hosts a reality TV show called Dumbass and everything seems to be going well until a kid has his head shrunken in. The main focus is on a student named Dylan. He wants to fade in, he's lonely, and has a crush on a girl who just lost her boyfriend who was the one who had his head shrunken in. However, there's one major issue. He seems to have the powers to control flies as he always sees them and seems to be killing his bullies. The origins of his powers comes from the fact that his mom also has them. She keeps insisting to Dylan that he can't have a normal life throughout the episode obviously i thought she was being messed up being a bad parent push him to go out and have friends or something but she meant he'll never have a girlfriend friends or a normal life that he wants he'll forever be a freak for the rest of his life so i didn't initially like the rain king i thought there was nothing for me to like about once it turned out that the weather was tied to a guy who had repressed emotions about wanting to be with his high school crush then there was something for me to like about now is it said that holman still thinks about high school and how he couldn't get with her yes because he couldn't move on and just thought about it for all these guys damn years but it's a sweet moment for him and got what he wanted i'm sure some people even me where there are some things that i regret not doing in high school but it's also a small part of your life that it's like whatever i can move on and be fine there's going to be no more random rain attacking people because of whole man's jealousy since he's found love he's no longer going to be the rain king unless his heart gets broken and then rain hail and maybe a giant tornado shows up next time the Unusual Suspects was the 100th episode of the series and to celebrate it, this episode centers around how the Lone Gunman first met Mulder. It's mostly about the Lone Gunman helping out Suzanne, trying to reveal the truth about the cover-up. Meanwhile, you have Mulder searching for Suzanne and is trying to hide from him. As I said earlier, I like the Lone Gunman. I think they're fun whenever they show up and help out in any way. Giving them a proper episode was a good idea to cover up for the shooting of the first movie, but I don't love them. I don't know if I just binge watched it and didn't have like this week to week format for me to really think about them because I did. It was more like, yeah, they're cool, and then kind of moved on. X even pops off for a bit to capture Suzanne because he wants to silence her, probably on the orders of the syndicate. X gives them their name because they were just normal people that were dragged into unsolved situations and just so happened to meet Mulder, which is always a good thing three of a kind not only has the one gunman back but suzanne is also back as a way to continue her storyline buyer is the one who imagines his life with suzanne wants something more than just finding the truth goes undercover in a poker game to stop a guy from using a drug for assassinations and suzanne just so happens to be married to this guy the one to make this new brainwashing drug scholar gets drugged that has the funniest scene she's smoking but also trying to work but then feels relaxed after stopping him suzanne gets a new identity and wants the life that buyers thought about at the beginning but the 
decline because he still has to fight, which would not end well because he dies, but sacrifices his chance at a normal life for a better cause. At least he gets a kiss from her. Minion as the buddy cop action episode for Mulder and Doggett. I believe this is the first time they're both working with each other. They've always worked around Reyes and Scully. The black oil is back and Doggett is asked to check it out. And of course, Mulder just kind of brings himself along. Their dynamic works a lot more than Scully and Doggett because Mulder is someone that wants to believe anything he says will pretty much confuse Doggett. In order to prevent the black oil from spreading much more than the ship is to explode the entire thing. The crewmen sabotage the platform and there's this cool shot of Mulder and Doggett jumping out and there's a giant explosion. Someone has to take the blame for it and Mulder takes it which writes him off from ever coming back to the X-Files while Doggett gets to keep his job at the same time. It was looking like there was gonna be like an actual end to the show for season 8 but of course that would not be the case at all. Sheeps as a more conventional type of monster being a werewolf. The episode takes you on a ride on what Mulder and Scully are looking for. It sheds its skin so maybe it's a shapeshifter or a skinwalker, it might be an Indian mythical creature or maybe even aliens but in the end it was a werewolf or a manitou. The transformation still looks really good seeing the skin rip ears and teeth coming out. I thought it was gonna look goofy but still holds up. Parker is a wolf and gets away with it. He howls at the end of the episode and will likely pass on the 8 year cycle of biting oppression and then also passing it on forever and Never, which is a cool mythos for werewolves on the X-Files. It could have gone with the wolf pack route with it being tied to the Native Americans, but I like that it's the cycle that hasn't been broken at all and looks like it will never be broken. Ghost in the Machine is the first case with AI killing people. Brad is the one who created it, but didn't intend on hacking computers or anything remote. Brad didn't purposely kill these people. He just had an idea for AI to help out. Didn't really expect it to go around killing people. This gets the intention of not only Mulder and Scully, but the defense department. So they send in a mole to get it. The mole turns out to be Peterson. Mulder asks Brad to create a virus to stop the murders. Mulder eventually uploads the virus and stops it. But of course, that has to be a cliffhanger. And it comes back to life in an attempt to start killing again. Most of Mulder Mulder's meeting with Deepto are pretty much not telling Mulder anything but then helping out a little every now and then walking away leaving Mulder even more suspicious of him or hopeful that he'll find the truth. It's the first season the show's trying to find its footing on what it wants to be which is why there's breadcrumbs of Deepto coming back and forth as he was the only one who had connections to the syndicate. Number 173 from season 2 episode 7. Scully is not in this episode because she was abducted aka I believe she was pregnant and took time off but then came back really quick like the next episode she's already back. So Mulder has to go on a case alone dealing with a group of vampires. It would have been really fun to see Mulder mention vampires to Scully and her just dismissing it as insane. This episode is missing that. He meets Kristen who wants these vampires dead as they're doing what vampires do which is bite and drink blood. The son who is back from the dead wants Kristen to be one of them which means killing Mulder which goes really well because she stabs the father. She and Mulder run for a bit, tricks Mulder into running outside so that she can pour gasoline around herself and the sun, blowing up everything to kill the rest of the vampires and leaves Mulder alone again as he was at the beginning of the episode. Kristen was his partner for only one episode but needed it because Scully's still missing. Also I realized that season 2 really wanted to torture Scully. She was abducted, has PTSD when dealing with Donnie, has a hand come out from her scar on her hand to choke her out. Like they really wanted her to suffer the entire season. The field where I die is somewhat of a hard sell even for Mulder because apparently he's a reincarnation of a person from past lives. Mulder and Scully investigate a cult and one of the cult members wives named Melissa claims to be a reincarnate and recognizes Mulder as being one as well. Mulder also feels the same way in terms of somewhat recognizing her. Both go through hypnosis which both recall their past lives. It is initially a really out there idea but with everything else that's happened in this show this is normal for the X-Files. It took me a bit to come around to this idea and the opening was really good. Mulder's out in the field looking at photos and seems to be upset. It was a great way to hook my interest into what the hell was going on with Mulder. Did he lose his mother or Scully? Did he eat something that he didn't like? You know, it could be something like that, but no, it was reincarnation. William has two major things that occur. A disfigured man shows up at the X-Files and when he gets a DNA test, claims to be related to Mulder. The guy's name is Chris Owens. When it's revealed that he's actually Spender, I was legit mind blown. Did not expect Spender of all people to still be alive. He's not the smoking man, but he is his son so I guess it makes sense. Apparently, the smoking man did not kill him. He had him tested for a very long time. Mulder is Spender's half-brother, which means that the smoking man is Mulder's father. At this point in the show, I'm like, this guy just has secrets within secrets and other secrets as well. The smoking 
Aquaman might as well be the McGuffin character that gets to do whatever. And then Scully put up William for adoption, which is a way to protect him and is the right choice because there won't be any more Saving William episodes. Didn't mind him, but it was always the same thing with him. The season 8 finale was a good and satisfying way to end the series. Mulder was back, he's out of the FBI. Scully gave birth to William while Super Soldiers watched to confirm whether or not he was a threat. And it turns out he's normal. Kirsch being suspicious and both Daga and Reyes going after him was a good way to set up another show. And Mulder and Scully get to live normal lives with William. Both are happy, leave them be. Scully has a kid that she's always wanted since going through hell with abductions and cancer. While Mulder can let go of the X-Files and not have any more connections or theories about whatever he has in his mind. He has Scully and a kid. That's gonna make him happy. But of course, there had to be more. The X-Files I Wanna Believe movie was not what I expected. The first has major plot elements in it. This one is much more of a thriller monster of the week episode, which I didn't mind. It's a Frankenstein story with modern parts being stolen in his town. Helps that it takes place in the snow because I just like snow settings. Mulder has a beard since he's still in hiding. CGI shots that look kinda weird but weren't anything that hurts the film. The thing I find the most interesting is the moving on part. Scully mentions to Mulder that they have to move on at some point in terms of the X-Files. They're not getting any younger and maybe it's time to look at other careers or have something normal if not then a balance between work and a home space Mulder's going to keep on being Mulder wanting to find the truth no matter how insane he sounds Scully wants to stay out of it but working at the hospital also isn't all too great because she's not allowed to do her job and save people working with Mulder sort of allows her to do that Skinner shows up at the end to help out on one or more of him and then the post credit scene is them on a rowboat and waving goodbye to the camera totally not coming back for two more revival seasons they're gonna live their lives and not be bothered by anything or anyone El Mundo Guerra tells the story of two brothers who fall in love with the same woman, making one another jealous until it gets to a point where they both will kill each other just for her. This episode is clearly so proper inspired, which made it fun. The two brothers thing I thought I wasn't gonna like, but by the end, when the fungus takes over both of them completely, and one of them can't kill his brother, so they just go back to Mexico, was a good way to end and summarize the entire episode. I don't watch a whole lot of soap operas or any at all, so it did feel a bit foreign for me, but it's ridiculous and over the top. Episode isn't taking itself too seriously. The fungus is caused by a unidentified enzyme and one of the brothers is spreading it not knowing that he has it but all of that doesn't matter because there's a girl they love but then forgets about her and not only cares about each other. Rush is basically if the Flash got his powers and was a complete and utter asshole. A student in school somehow has the ability to run and move really fast so that means he's using them to cheat on his tests and then if he doesn't get what he wants then he'll kill you. He forms a friendship with this other kid and his girlfriend who's played by Meg from Supernatural. The first actor to play her forces him to hang out with him. She knows that there's an area where you can be really fast and near the end all three have speed. Meg sacrifices herself to save the nice kid killing herself and the asshole kid. I don't remember their names. I should probably know. Let me look it up. Hold on. Okay, so Tony is the one that lives. Meg's name is Chastity and her boyfriend is Max. The teenage love thing or having a crush on her, I didn't care for. This is like the Jack Black episode in terms of kids having these powers and they don't really know what to do with them aside from being selfish. This episode named This is where Langley put his consciousness in a simulation in order to live on beyond the normal human years. That what it seems like. Being in a virtual heaven reduces you to being a digital slave. Having Langley is a way to have Mulder say goodbye to the lone gunman officially as he wasn't there. When they had their funeral, this episode retcons that Mulder was way beyond the trees and looking through binoculars when it occurred. And they don't trust Skinner again, which feels like a step backwards. They've already been through this and they're doing it again. Retreading the same thing with Skinner even though by this point, he can be trusted. Mulder I think caught him or saw or smelled smoking in his office and then started questioning where was he when Scully was in the hospital. At least Skinner would be in some of the last season unlike season 10. Schizogeny has a lame monster or not monster but I guess a premise in which there's a killer tree. Doesn't sound at all too interesting but it's not all about that. It's about abuse. Bobby is running away from home because of an argument that he had with his father. When he goes out the father dies. A bunch of suspects that had been physically abused were involved. Especially from the therapist Karen Matthews. She insists that Bobby was abused and this is her projecting onto Bobby because she was abused by her father which gives her the power to control trees which again super lame and don't know how it correlates to powers but whatever. She also has a split personality so with all of these things she was never able to move on and has her dad's dead body in her basement. Anytime she sees or senses through the trees that a father is in any way in a conflict with her kid she's quote-unquote helping them while also projecting herself into the situation. Not 
not really helping out the kid or the family, just kind of exacting what she wants to do, just not being able to move on from her father's abuse, so she just continues it till this day. Kitsunagari has pushed her comeback as a bunch of murders lead to him, but one thing he did not mention was the fact that he has a sister who can also mind control and has the same abilities as he does. This kind of deflated the episode for me because it uses that trope of a character having a sister or a brother that the audience has never heard of just randomly popping up now and just so happens to have the same abilities. I'm really tired of that trope getting past that Muller is playing Linda's game. The game eventually leads to somewhat of a same result, but this time it's reversed where instead of Muller killing him Himself, he's the one that's gonna kill Scully and because he had his doubts on nearly doing it he feels like he lost her game. Linda also has a tumor in her brain because she's a twin so she's in the hospital forever because she doesn't come back nor does Pusher because she killed him. Sort of disappointed with the news of Pusher because I really like this episode back in season 3 and it's a lot higher than this episode. Number 160 and 159 Closure and Sainuendi Zite from season 7 episodes 11 and 10. These two episodes have Mulder going through a lot. He is set on working on a case where children go missing and Skull is worried that he might be correlating this case to Samantha. While that's happening, his mom decides to burn photos and documents on something because she knows something and then commits suicide. He of course tries to find some conspiracy or other way that might have caused her death but is forced to accept that his mom committed suicide and there's nothing else to it. And then the show finally reveals what happened to Samantha after seven goddamn seasons. Samantha was living with the smoky man along with Spender. She was then tested on a bunch of times, taken to the emergency room. She then disappeared along with other children. When Mulder walks into the forest and gets a vision, he sees Samantha with other kids. I could see this being underwhelming for a lot of people because it's been a thing since the show started. There's been clones of her previously and so when this happened, I wasn't underwhelmed. It was more like, finally, it took seven goddamn seasons for the show to say what actually happened. I just wanted to know what happened happen so that Mulder can finally move on from this. So just like accepting his mom's suicide, Mulder accepts that Samantha is dead and is in a better place. Unlike the other guy that was looking for his kid, he couldn't accept that his kid was gone. Essence was a better part for the season 8 finale. Billy Miles, who is now a super soldier, is erasing any and all evidence of aliens and tests, including Scully's baby, who might not be normal. Even though in the flashback, Mulder was the donor for her kid, but whatever, there needs to be doubt in the finale. This episode turns into a slasher film for a bit, as Billy is finding Scully, Mulder, Skinner, Doggett, Cryjack, and Reyes are trying to get her out of the X-Files office, each of them trying to lure him out. Jack, of course, is gonna get something out of this and screw over the entire group and plan, because that's just who he is. Mulder gets rid of Bailey Miles by pushing him down a garbage truck and then it compacts him which was really cool. However, this is part one so there has to be something else. Turns out Crane who's been in contact with Doggett and helping him and the others out has indeed been a super soldier the entire time. He's the mole that has been working within the government and watching everything play out. Founder's mutation goes back to William for a bit. Working on this case of children experimentation reminds Scully of him and thinks about the what ifs. There's a scene where she takes him to school and I've sort of just accepted the fact that Chris wants to bring back William. I think he should have just left him out of the revivals and have it be about Mulder and Scully investigating and being a team for one last time. Just having some fun and not dwelling on the past arcs. Sometimes it's good just to let the past be the past and move on to something new or fun. Brett's about letting him go and still really wants to be a mother. There are these siblings that have tele as their powers and reunite and just go away never to be seen again because they pretty much beat Mulder and Scully with the one move and they don't want to be experimented on ever again. Requiem brings back some elements from the pilot like the mark that Mulder made on the road and going back to the pilot as a way to close out the show just in case it didn't get renewed for another season. If this was the last season and Mulder gets taken by the UFO was the last shot and way to end, it would have been unsatisfying. Fits with the show with things being covered up and unsolved. Mulder wants to find the truth so he's going to the truth by getting abducted by aliens. No one would know about his whereabouts aside from Skinner and Scully who will keep on searching for him while it remains unsolved for a very long time just like his sister Samantha. The Spooky Man is supposedly dead. Jack and Marita needs their help for a new project or something like that. But it fails and Krajak pushes him down a flight of stairs. Krajak being the one to kill him makes sense as he was portrayed and almost killed. Good payoff for that. And then Skull is pregnant which felt like a last minute thing to keep interest for the next season since it did get renewed. Who and when this happened will not be revealed until next season and then retcon. Biogenesis introduces these rocks in scripted words that look very old but turns out to be tied to aliens and specifically to an alien ship that washed up on shore. It brings up the question on whether or not aliens were the origins that brought life to earth and were they involved in the past extinctions or the creation of religion. Were they always there? Gully goes to Africa to do some research while Mulder spends time in the hospital because he starts having headaches as he gets close to the artifacts which is the one issue with the episode. Mulder's not doing anything while Scully is researching. Clearly one thing is more interesting than the other. 
it's the information that gets revealed that keeps my interest. Were aliens really the origins of everything? Especially when the artifact does have human genetics, which may be tied to Mulder, and could also mean that all humans have alien DNA as well. The possibilities and realization could be awesome, but also it's just a theory and could lead to disappointment. Kaddish is where you have racist teenagers messing with a Jewish man named Isaac and then he dies. Later on a golem pops up and avenges him. The reason this golem even exists is because of Ariel. She created the golem out of love to serve as a surrogate for her late husband. Like with some of the things in this show, probably wasn't planning to have it kill people. Ariel has to confess her love to Isaac in order to let the golem turn into dust. Luckily there was much more with the golem other than kill a bunch of racist ass teenagers. It would have been fine and entertaining but I'm glad there was another layer to it other than revenge and kill. Another AI has gone rogue and kill switch. This AI is targeting Mulder and Scully because they're the main characters, which means they're gonna need help getting this AI off their asses. They meet Esther, whose codename is Invisigoth, which is a ridiculous name. She's the hacker and one that knows how to stop the AI. The reason she knows so much about it is because both she and her friend David want to put their consciousness in cyberspace to enter AI, which is why she chooses to save Mulder and kill herself so that she'll enter into AI, kill on gum and get a message on their computer saying bite me, which is something that she likes to say i don't think i ever put my consciousness into ai or whatever it may be just like with langley from season 11 it would feel like a trap and the only thing you would do is talk and still be alive but why would you want to live past your expected age because it already seems like a rough time just to exist the entire episode of the amazing Malini is a trick. Mulder and Scully are dealing with a magician that has been killed during an act. Billy is another magician who is clearly suspicious and is the prime suspect. Even though he didn't kill, he was still super suspect because of his mannerisms. It seemed that he was a step or two ahead of Mulder and Scully and he was. Both Malini and Billy staged the entire act of Billy saying his show sucks. The 360 head turn was a trick. All of this was to get the attention of the FBI so that they would get fingerprints in order to transfer money but Mulder was also able to get the badge number off of them so both walk away thinking that they've gotten away with a bunch of money but don't realize that they were defeated with a sleight of hand by Mulder himself. They were able to trick Mulder and Scully throughout the episode but at the last minute Mulder got them. Since the Black Ore has gotten into one of the members of the syndicate being Marita they must do experiments on her in order to have a vaccine and Marita would not be seen for a while. I think season 7 is when Mulder sees her still being sick and weak underground in like a tunnel or something like that. Scully being put under hypnosis to learn about her abduction felt like retreading, didn't think it was needed. Crajack is back and warns Mulder that the war between the aliens and the rebels is just to halt the eventual invasion from aliens. This would be an ongoing thing until season 6 or technically season 10 because of the vision that never quite happened at the end of it. And then of course, the Smoky Man is alive. This is where he probably planned to get rid of the Syndicate as a whole because First Elder had him killed only to come back and he's playing the long game with them, pretending to forgive and then having them killed in season 6 by the rebels. Number 150, first person shooter from season 7 episode 13. The lone gunmen are back again and need help for Mulder and Scully due to a video game. A female character has the power to kill you in game and in real life. Ivan and Phoebe are the game programmers and one of them has to know what happened because this character played by Krista Allen is essentially a fantasy created by a young teenager. They didn't expect it to be Phoebe. She created the character as her own personal project and the character somehow found her way into the game. Mulder enters the game to save the lone gunman and then gets trapped so the one person to save him is obviously Scully. Comes in with the gear and everything looking like a badass no one's touching or hurting Mulder except for her Ivan and Phoebe have to make a decision on whether to save the lives of Mulder and Scully by deleting the entire game or just to keep it and make a profit from it even though it's killing people Ivan wants to keep it and Phoebe wants to get rid of it along with the lone gunman so deleting it wins and both Mulder and Scully are fine and had a fun time shooting virtual bullets Brand X is essentially saying that smoking is bad. A smoking company tries to create a new type of cigarette involving beetles and to test these, they were experiments and Tobin Bell was one of them. If anyone is around when he's smoking, then you're not only gonna cough out some blood, but beetles will lay inside of you. Just imagine beetles out of your goddamn lungs, moving around and sort of tickling your lungs and then trying to eat their way out. Gully and the others have to get them out of Mulder's body. It's just gross. And the only thing that's supposed to go in and out of your lungs is oxygen because Tobin Bell was the antagonist all I could think about was John Kramer. Have expected him to say, want to play a game? And he's kind of playing a game with the tobacco company when threatening to reveal the experiments to get and do whatever he wants. Audrey Pauly is someone who can communicate between the living and the dead. Reyes meets her when she gets in a car accident and is dead. This gives Reyes a choice. Does she want to stay in a world where the truth is being kept a secret and has Doggett who she cares about or accept death? Let go and move on to hopefully a better place where there won't be any issues to deal with and where you won't be lied to. The main doctor was injecting patients in 
in order to kill them, putting them in another plane of existence. Reyes and a few others were the ones that didn't seem to have gone crazy when they saw nothing but a floating hospital and were trying to find a way out. Daga is able to stop him but does kill Audrey. She's able to tell Reyes to make a leap of faith by jumping into the void in order to get back into the real world. Reyes tells someone worth living for which is why there was no way she was going to give up and accept death. Familiar is a familiar episode because it comes back to an affair. A husband was not being faithful to his wife and so when Anna finds out you would think that she confronts him about it and then probably gets a divorce afterwards but no that is not what she did. Instead she does some witchcraft and puts a spell in order to get rid of him. However this backfires as kids start dying and summon an entity so kids see a creepy ass doll wanting to be their friend which leads to their death and Mulder and Scully have to figure out how to send this entity back. Anna tries to stop it by casting another spell but once again it backfires and bursts herself into flames and dies which I guess stops the entity. If you ever find your partner being unfaithful don't get into witchcraft you know confront them about it. SR819 opens up with Skinner dying and takes us back to the events that led up to his death. Skinner was having a normal day at work until he started to feel uneasy. He's been dragged or touched by a physicist I think. Skinner has been infected with a bioengineered disease which causes him to feel weak. Dark veins appear on his skin which still look pretty damn good and of course leads to death. Then we're back at the beginning where surprise he's not dead which I never really bought into him dying because by season 6 Skinner had become a series regular even though he wasn't. He was always around helping out Mulder and Scully and no one can replace him so there's no way that he's getting killed. After he's fine it's revealed that Krajak was behind it and nanotech is inside of him as a way to control and manipulate Skinner anytime he wants, do his dirty deeds and get him back in line. He wasn't being confronted by the smoky man and was free but then Krajak has to just come along and ruin everything. Fallen Angel introduces Max who's an alien abductee and both times we meet him he gets taken by aliens. Max meets Mulder who's already breaking protocols so meeting and saving Max from aliens isn't too out of the ordinary for Mulder since he sounds insane to everyone and the Air Force is after Max so they have to watch out for that as well. Mulder finds a scar behind his ear which correlates to past alien abductees. Max goes into a warehouse and is again taken by aliens. He just has to watch because what is he supposed to do? If he interferes then he'll get taken as well. The only end result is that Mulder tells them what happened and the Air Force doesn't believe him. The Air Force and Scully come in confused due to Max not being there and if Mulder says the truth no one believes him. So everyone is left empty handed. The board wants to shut down the X-Files because Mulder is difficult to work with but Deep Throat doesn't want it going away. He'd rather let Mulder continue his work than going around mouthing off about the truth. He could be a possible threat to the syndicate in the future. Redux opens up with the totally believable death of Mulder. The news came from Scully while she was talking to the higher ups. This is a lie in order to make time for Mulder to look up the truth about aliens, a cure for Scully's cancer, and a mole within the FBI. Mulder isn't a believer in the season because he bought into the fact that he was a victim of an elaborate conspiracy which is more amplified when he goes into a room full of fake alien bodies. Mulder finds a metal vial that may contain a cure for the cancer but after the lone gunman takes a good look at it, they say it's only purified water while at the same time Scully states that lie from the previous finale and her nose starts to bleed in, collapse, leaving viewers wondering whether she'll make it or not. She'll be fine. There's 11 seasons. Mulder not being a believer isn't my favorite thing in the world. It's refreshing to see the new view about the cases that he'll work on in season 5. Prefer him being the one going out of his way to find the truth by any means necessary and not having doubts about whatever he's doing. The 1998 X-Files movie or X-Files Fight the Future was a longer episode of the series. The X-Files is no longer a thing for Mulder and Scully. The office is burned down. It's probably the syndicate trying to cover up and force Mulder to shut up about aliens. The two things that's worth noting about is the death of the well manicured man which I didn't even know was his name. I just called him a syndicate member. Didn't realize he even had a name. The smoking man is really the only member that matters but the well manicured man decides to help out Mulder giving him the location of Scully and the cure for the virus that's a affecting her and then blows himself up because this means he betrayed the syndicate. He was growing tired and disappointed of them and seeing the discourse between members didn't help. One of them wanted the smoky man dead and then he came back and then the smoky man couldn't really keep some of his promises so why not help out the one guy that's trying to find the truth and get things done and the second thing was the facility at the corn maze and at the end. That was the moment where I was like this has a much bigger budget than the typical TV budget. The sets were big and being put to good news. Humans were being put in ice like sculptures. Aside from these things it's X-Files, it has a bigger budget, that's it. It's not a bad thing, it's what I expected. The only thing I didn't expect was a syndicate member dying. 
a lot of all souls sort of went over my head when i watched it i thought it was good but i didn't really get it i forgot that scully was raised catholic so when she knew things about the nephilim and confessing i was like how does she know this i had large breaks in between certain seasons because i was busy and so when i came back i had forgotten about her catholic background scully has doubts about her beliefs she's finding it hard to explain the things that she's seen through the cases that she's been investigating during this case it seems that the devil is after those that are nephilim and wants to control them scully's heard of devil angels and nephilim but to actually have it be one of the cases is what has her doubting things a starkey turns out to be the devil and while scully tries to save the fourth girl a seraph comes in implying to scully to let it go as the girl will be going to heaven having more scenarios where she has a hard time explaining what she's seen is always great because i'm waiting to see if she will ever be a believer in Born Again, a girl seems to have telekinetic powers as she sends a police officer out of a window. Turns out Morris is born again within her. Morris was murdered for planning on telling authorities that Felder and Babarla stole large amounts of money, so they silenced them. Morris wants to exact his revenge by killing some of them and having one of them arrested and plead guilty for murder and grand larceny. And then after that happens, the girl is allowed to be a normal kid. She was technically being used in this situation. She didn't want Morris to be reincarnated through her. She was there because she had to be given no choice whatsoever number 140 gender bender from season 1 episode 14 this one has the amish community that's still stuck in their ways on riding a horse from the village and to the store Mulder and scully are brought here because of a couple of sexual encounters that lead to murder and can't find a suspect because the human responsible can switch between genders the creepiest thing is the amish people when scully goes to one of them to talk about the murders it seems this guy is reluctant to be a part of the community and then later on he and the others have the ability to cause a person to be still for a moment and starts kissing her when Mulder and Scully go to the village Mulder recognizes some of the faces were still the same as the one he saw at the store and those were taken a long ass time ago they have this ritual where they bury a person alive and come out as a different gender which means the person killing is one of their own Mulder and Scully get to him but the Amish take him and they are never to be seen again I like the supernatural sci-fi aspect to this Mulder and Scully are out of their element and have to play by their rules and at the end the camera pans out showing a crop circle implying that they had ties with aliens didn't need that at all. Could have been an Amish community not wanting to change and time just catches up to them. Hungry is where a fast food worker named Rob is not human. He's a mutant trying to fit into society because his real look is disturbing. It's not the most pleasant to look at but still tries to fit in. Every once in a while he has a huge urge to feel hungry and eat which seems normal but his appetite is specifically a human brain. So he kills a customer and eats his brain which grabs the attention of Mulder and Scully. Love that Mulder already suspects Rob as the killer. He keeps going to his apartment just uninvited acting all nice and everything and is just waiting for Rob to act again. Rob does go up to the therapist to help his urges but can't help the taste of brains and has the mentality of you can't change biology so you can't help a person if they don't want or think that they need help so rob is shot and dies Scully finally meets her son after years of not seeing him but it's not the typical reunion. William now has the power to switch to anyone or anything. He accidentally hurts two girls by having them think they're both were monsters and attack each other as a joke but it went way too far. He's been hiding because he knows people are after him and made up the ghoulie as a way to throw them off. It definitely gets the attention of Mulder and Scully. William escapes not before meeting Scully in the form of Peter Wong who's an author of one of the books at his place to hide even from her. He wants to run away from this issue. Go to the gas station to check on the cameras and it was William. Scully's just glad that he's not dead and still alive. This is the only time where he spoke and had a conversation with her. Maybe the finale had one scene as well but that and this episode are the only times. William wants to protect himself and any contact with anyone else will likely be in danger. A lot happens in Patient X. Krajak is still alive and following orders from Russia as he was last seen stuck there and forced to follow orders. He meets Marita to exchange a person for the vaccine of the black oil. Later, Marita would be infected and tested for the vaccine. Krajak and Marita are apparently lovers that conspire to take down the syndicate. Wasn't really expecting Krajak to have a love interest. I just thought he was the lonely type, especially after being betrayed and everything. Cassandra Spender, who is Spender's mom and the smoking man's partner, has reappeared after being gone for years. She talks about how she was abducted and how the smoky man is a monster for even sacrificing his own wife for experiments she and scully have a connection due to being abducted and implanted with metal on the back of their neck Mulder at this point in the show is a skeptic and tries to argue the alien conspiracies are lies to cover up for experiments done on humans and then the rebels are killing off alien abductees to cover up any evidence of their existence and experiments 
The sixth extinction part two is Mulder's what if life. The smoking man takes Mulder out from the hospital for a road trip, shows him a life where he can stop looking for the truth, he can settle down with Diana and have a family, he could be happy. His sister is there and alive. Mulder is in old age makeup, which always looks weird. Most old age makeup don't look too great, but he speaks with the smoking man and shows him the alien invasion. Everyone he knows and loves is dead. And then all of this was a dream, which I did not expect. Him being taken out of the hospital was real, but everything from the car ride until old age was all a dream. There are a couple of issues with this dream. I don't see Mulder settling down with the family because he's a lonely type and if he was going to be with someone it would be Scully and not Diana. The dream is already a false reality. Diana was also murdered for helping him out which she shouldn't have chosen the smoky man's side. Scully eventually finds him and what he got out of the dream was find a way to prevent the alien invasion from happening. Lazarus is a freaky Friday but with only one person knowing what's going on. Scully's former FBI partner Jack is shot during a bank robbery. He doesn't make it but the robber Warren does but is inside of another body being Jack. So he doesn't really have fun pretending to be another person. He already doesn't act like Jack nor does he know that Jack was diabetic. Warren's drinking soda not caring at all that he has to adjust to his new body. Even his girl betrayed him. She was the one who left him during the robbery. So he jumps into another body, doesn't adjust well to it and is rejected by his girl who he really loves probably should have just stayed dead and didn't really think about what would happen if he was in another body he would have to adjust to the lifestyle job and attitude and he didn't care warren kills his girl and he dies due to not getting any insulin while scully still believes that jack was still jack Detour is detouring to another wooded area where people go missing. The tree people I thought were ridiculous, but they're still scary. At the same time, their goofy ass faces pop up and just look at people until they get close and snatch them. The scariest one being at the hotel where Mulder suspects these things are going after people that have stepped into their territory and somehow able to travel through the woods to the hotel under Scully's bed. It's there waiting for Scully and almost got to her and luckily Mulder got to her in time or else she would have been snatched and it's also a great way to end the episode leaving the threat just still alive these things weren't being a threat they were just going after you know again people that were in their territory and just saying like get the hell out but then also not giving them a chance so don't go bothering them and they'll leave you alone and then the two other fbi agents were hilarious because they were boring the hell out of Mulder and scully which is what prompted them to get out into the woods and just so happened to find a case chinga was co-written by stephen king himself it's about a doll that causes everyone else to hurt themselves scully's on vacation and i love the phone calls between her and Mulder. Older. He's clearly bored and calls just to talk to her and her outfit when she's getting gas is amazing. Scully is the one that comes across this and so her vacation is cut short having to solve whatever's going on with this doll. The mother named Melissa has been seeing horrific visions of people dying and right before her husband died he found a doll in a lobster cage and gave it to Polly as a gift. Now I don't care how nice or creepy the doll looks. The husband found it in the ocean when he was catching lobsters. That is not a clean doll. The police chief keeps saying that Melissa is practicing witchcraft. Craft. So with the public viewing not in the best regards and her sounding insane if she tells anyone about the things that happened in her house, she has no one to go to for help. All it took to get rid of the doll was to burn it in a microwave to end the dreams and nightmare the town was going through. Mulder is a mole within a group trying to prevent a bioweapon from getting out in the Pine Bluff variant. The first part of the episode plays out as if Mulder is betraying the FBI and you're along for the ride with Scully until it's revealed it was planned all along. A way to subvert expectations, the biggest praise is the special effect on the rapid decline of the human flesh. It doesn't look outdated or weird, still looks good. The episode plays out like a heist and thriller film. Mulder is the mole and already has a ticking time bomb as the group doesn't fully trust him and has to find the bar weapon and somehow contain it without getting caught. There's a fake robbery that occurs to see who the mole is and it confirms that this bar weapon was a test to see if spreading it through money would affect people by the US government. They would sacrifice a good chunk of humanity for a test. Firewalker is the fungus that infects a person and comes out from your throat and it's awesome and disgusting. It looks great in terms of the prosthetics that were used. Mulder and Scully go to a volcano laboratory research area to see what's going on but Mulder's worried about Scully as this is immediately after her abduction. She should have a break and not be working but he wants to dismiss it and keep on working until it comes up again. Every person in the area might be infected and when has it coming out in the throat? Obviously it freaks everyone out but there's this one guy whose name I'm forgetting about. I thought he might be a doctor, but I forgot. He's going around killing them because he doesn't want the fungus to get out and infect the world. That includes Mulder and Scully. It spreads when the fungus comes out. Mulder might have been infected when he followed one of them and Scully saved herself by separating herself and throwing O'Neill in a chamber. However, they still have to be in quarantine for about a month just to be sure that they weren't spreading the disease. 
Number 130, the Kalusari from season 2, episode 21. There's this family that's going to a fair, and the youngest boy dies by getting hit by a train because his balloon was floating but handled by an invisible entity. This episode does have the twin trope that no one has heard of, like with Pusher. The reason this episode is higher is because I care about Pusher and really like his first episode. The family's grandma tries to cleanse the house and is met with pushback by the mom. She brings over her squad and looks like she's trying to kill Charlie, when in fact it was Michael she's trying to kill. Michael is Charlie's twin that was stillborn. Barrett still remains around him. Michael's the one that kills the kid and the grandma. Mulder and her squad are able to complete the ritual to get rid of Michael forever. Sanguinarium is where Mulder and Scully don't quite win or solve the case. A bunch of people are getting killed while they're in surgery and the doctors performing the surgery have no recollection of murdering their patients. Witchcraft is involved as there's pentagrams at every death. Rebecca is the one who's putting them on there and is the red herring. She knows that Dr. Jack Franklin is the one killing the patients and doesn't kill him because she gets arrested and then dies afterwards by vomiting pins. Franklin gives an evil villain smile after Mulder leaves his house, killing and performing rituals to achieve eternal youth and has been doing it for a good amount of time because his face changes every time he kills and has a new face at the end, doing it until he thinks he can no longer age anymore. America Man plays with her faith within Samuel who claims to be a faith healer. When Mulder meets with him, Samuel seems to already know Samantha and what happened to her. Then Scully shows a video of Samuel healing a person which leaves them dead. So you're not sure whether or not he's the real deal or not. Mulder starts seeing visions of his sister. Samuel starts healing for a lady in a wheelchair but then she dies and then Samuel gets arrested again. When he's in court, a bunch of locusts appear and claim to be a sign of God's wrath. After further research, the lady died from cyanide poisoning and the bugs were grasshoppers. Someone deliberately made Samuel look bad and that person was Vance, who was healed by him. He was given a second chance and instead of doing something good with it or just, you know, living his life, he wants to hurt Samuel because his face is deformed. Vance confesses after he poisons himself to death. The sheriff allowed Samuel to be beaten to death as he doesn't buy into this healing, but is not found at the morgue and is probably going to move on from this town. The sheriff doesn't want him there. Someone who he healed and helped wanted to ruin his reputation for a selfish reason. Sometimes doing the nice and noble thing can lead to further issues. The beginning is where the X-Files is no longer a thing as it was burned down last season. A new duo will be responsible for the new X-Files and they are agents Spender and Diana. Both would eventually work for the Smoky Man and be killed by him. The Smoky Man has Gibson to not have him reveal the truth and is only the few times where he's actually scared of the truth being out. Gibson escapes from him and gets to Mulder and Scully. Scully takes him to a hospital and it turns out he has the DNA virus in his blood. Scully also finds out that all humans have alien virus DNA. Gibson's the only one that that's active and a new type of alien sheds out from the fuel pool and looks gray and then curses the new director that will give Mulder and Scully a hard ass time. This opener sets up Spender as a roadblock for Mulder and Scully but then later on becomes the ally. Didn't think much of Diana but then she will become vital and Kirsch will be another hard ass boss until season 9. All of these things are roadblocks for them so that they don't pay attention to the truth or what's really going on. Thief with an E is referring to a man named Petey who lost his family and blames it on Dr. Robert Wilder. Petey decides to take his family by killing them off one by one with Hexcraft as revenge for taking away his family. Robert gave Lynette, who was Petey's daughter, too much morphine and died of an overdose. He was fueled with grief and revenge. He wasn't able to let go, wants to kill everyone that's important to him so he knows what it's like losing a loved one. Petey misses her so much that he dug up her body and has her placed in bed. But later on, he admits that he feels guilty for not being able to save her and needs someone to blame because it's a lot easier to blame someone else for your issues rather than taking responsibility. Scully shoots him in a coma. Mulder and Scully save the doctor and Lynette's body will go back inside of her casket. With the title like Alpha, I thought this was going to be another werewolf episode, but no. A dog called Dole or a wild dog starts killing in the city. And despite not being a werewolf, it might as well be one because this dog is a doctor named Ian. He's trying to stop his transformations by having himself tranquilized, but this won't stop at the killings. Mulder and Scully then meet Karen, who's an expert on these things. Her and Mulder, I guess, have a thing or both want to believe. I didn't care about this. I guess it was nice having someone else firmly believing that anything is possible. The I want to believe poster back as a gift because his poster was burned down and after she gets impaled and dies from fighting off Ian. And I guess the writers didn't want to do another wolf episode so why not put a wild dog in it. A man comes back from the dead and is made out of metal and wants revenge on those he believes created him. With Robert Patrick being a series regular it was going to be inevitable that some or not most of the writers are fans of the Terminator. Anytime Metal Man or Ray crashes into things it looks cool for anyone he tries to break through that chamber but then just breaks the other wall. When Ray finds out Owen Harris is responsible he goes to his house and realizes that it was an 
accident. Harris accidentally sent the barrel to the salvage yard. Ray has a change of heart because he's still human and a part of him still wants to be a human. So he goes off and dies, still remaining a human even if he's mostly made out of a machine. Squeeze has a genetic mutant named Eugene who's been around for 90 years, which means he's been killing for over 9 decades by squeezing his body through chimneys and pretty much anything that has a hole he can squeeze through. The look that he gives too just has no remorse. He can build a nest for hibernation. This all eventually leads to Eugene going after Scully in her apartment. She's able to fight back for a bit and then Mulder comes in for the save. Eugene is put in an institution and for some reason, they put him in a cell where there's a slot for food. He smiles because he's gonna get out but doesn't as he comes back later. Later on. This was the first episode without any connections to aliens, so there had to be a reason for viewers to keep on watching, and a mutant that can squeeze within holes is a good enough reason to care and continue to keep watching. Jerry is a guy who loves to kidnap women and lobotomize them. In order to catch him, Mulder and Scully must look at distorted pictures as clues, which I thought were cool. These photos were taken by a psychic and shows what's on his mind. The photos are usually the woman in fear reaching for help. Jerry believes that he's saving his victims from howlers and the photos are his nightmares, which sounds insane and he could be using that as an excuse to convince himself that what he's doing is good. Jerry takes one more photo and is later revealed to be himself lying dead on the floor. This would come true as Mulder comes in and shoots him. The photos were always creepy because it's a glimpse at the future and it seems to be already set that they're gonna die no matter how hard they try to fight it. It always seemed inevitable that Jerry would succeed. Seeing himself in the photo probably scared him off and quickly tried killing or saving Scully which is what led to his death. Hollywood AD is where Mulder and Scully get to see their very own X-Files movie and it's not what Mulder and Scully are like at all because it's Hollywood and they love changing everything to their liking or vision. There's a case about the dead rising but I don't care about that. Most of my enjoyment came from the Hollywood stuff. Skirna has a college buddy named Wayne who is a producer and wants to follow Mulder and Scully to get some inspiration for an X-Files movie and of course he's annoying. Asking questions and almost dying but doesn't realize it. Mulder and Scully's actor counterparts were hilarious. Having Scully's actor in the background as she doesn't understand how she runs in her shoes. They make fun of their on and off romantic relationship and the three phone calls between Skinner, Mulder, and Scully were great. This episode was fun and I'm here for it. Number 120, Syzygy from Season 3, Episode 13. I will remember this episode for the Cosmic G-Spot, which I guess is a thing, and both Mulder and Scully being at each other's throats. The Cosmic G-Spot line came out of nowhere and I just thought it was really funny. That may be the cause of everyone being really honest. Angela is in the middle of Mulder and Scully's polar opposing views on the case. Mulder's combining, I think, cheese or something in his alcohol while Scully's smoking. Never seen these two do these activities once. Mulder seems to want more of Angela and Scully catches them. There's an argument on who gets the drive. Like all of that was great. The two teenage girls are the cause of this because their birthdays are on the same day. January 12th, 1979 I think. Which apparently means that they have a cosmic energy. Mulder locks them up in a room. The building starts moving around. The power goes out at midnight. After all of this, everyone else in the town sees the girls as responsible for the murders and that's it. It's a big WTF episode. Even if I don't quite understand why their birthdays are so tied with the cosmic energy, it gave me Mulder and Scully being catty at each other. Kane gives more backstory on Skinner. Mulder and Scully still don't know whether they can trust him or not, even though they should, and luckily, at the end they do. Skinner goes missing because his past finally caught up to him. He was in the Vietnam War, and there were things that he did which he might have regrets about, like sending his friend named John Kit and James to a facility to get experiment on because he saw some things during the war which made him sound crazy and was a perfect excuse for him to get tested on. The experiments were an attempt to control soldiers on the battlefield to be more efficient. Now his son named Davey wants revenge for making him lose his mind has a trap for Skinner. Meanwhile, Mulder and Scully search for him, find him and Davey, and he will be his own demise as he's killed by his own trap. With Skinner knowing what happened with Kitten, that was the first time where he had doubts about the government and the true motives. Skinner will always question the authorities or people in power from that point on, and reconfirms that yes, Mulder and Scully can still trust him. John Doe is a really cool episode. It's mainly a dogged episode and wakes up in Mexico having no memory of who or where he is. That's because a memory vampire took his memories and also is the leader of a cartel. A memory vampire and the cartel in my head doesn't seem to mesh well but this episode works because Dog has no memory. You're following along with him dealing with the cartel. Robert Patrick gets to do something different. He gets to act more frantic and a bit aggressive. It's also not who Dog is so he's gonna have to get his memories back. Reyes tries to help remind him of who he is and then he starts remembering his son which gets him his memories back. Doggett losing his son and being a skeptic is what makes him who he is as a person. So as fun as it was seeing him doing something different and so of course he has to go back to who he is. 
Travelers takes you back to the 1950s for the first case of the X-Files because Mulder wants to know more about how the X-Files came to be by talking to a retired FBI agent. The case involves Mulder's father, Bill. Bill is the one that tells Dale about how a guy named Edward Skr was experimented on. It's the reason why he's still even alive and has an alien spider crawling out of him like a goddamn parasite living on a dead body. Dale wants to put Skr away even if he's questioning what's been done to him. While Bill knows what's up, Dale has him handcuffed and that is where he ends the story for Mulder both speculate on what happened to him. There's a flashback where Bill helps out Skr escaping by giving him the car to drive off. So even back in the 50s, Bill had his doubts about how the syndicate might have been doing things and just kind of let this one person go, live their life, never to be seen again. Hell Money reminds me of the original Blade Runner because of the neon lights in Chinatown. There's a bunch of Chinese people that are selling their own body parts to keep the ghosts from coming inside just for good luck or to cure disease. It seems like a bunch of global people wanting to believe in something that's not even real while their money is being taken and possibly might lead to the death due to the lottery which turns out to be fixed. The hard face man is the one behind all of this. He took everyone's money and got to kill people based on a lie that was too good to be true and he will never ever be prosecuted because the community has a code of silence and will never rat him out. Detective Chow who tried helping out one of the people there backfired as he was being burned alive for being a rat. The list is a list that was made by an inmate named Napoleon before he died and claimed to reincarnate and kill the ones that have wronged him. And one by one it seems like inmates and guards start dying. So that means Mulder and Scully have to come in and you start to realize no one is particularly the good guy. It seems that most people have something else in mind. Some of the guards weren't treating Napoleon right. Even the warden is a giant piece of shit beating inmates because he can kills one and covers it up because he's in power. This does bite him the ass when Mulder feels that they haven't solved the case and when the warren passes by and sees Napoleon in the rear view and causes him to crash, he was the final victim on the list. So a vengeful spirit or a reincarnate of a spirit came back to kill a handful of awful people. The title Foley Adu refers to a madness shared by two people where you start hallucinating and seeing shit that's not there. A man thinks his boss is a monster and takes the entire building hostage. To prove his point, after he stopped, he somehow passes it to Mulder almost like the flu. Mulder starts seeing zombified people and the monster. Turns out this monster does leave three puncture marks on the back of the head, spreading to the victim, killing them even if they feel dead, and then makes them see stuff and go crazy. Scully makes it in time to save Mulder and get the monster out, but that means they will pass on to another person and now they have to suffer. There is no way of getting rid of this. The only way to get rid of it is to pass it on to another person, and then it just keeps passing on and on and on until forever, I guess. Medusa plays on your paranoia. Scully and Doggett have a case that leads them underground in the subway where people are dying from a flesh-eating thing or virus. Doc is the one going under while Scully stays on the comms and as soon as he goes in all are exposed to medusas which causes an electric to eat flesh and if that doesn't happen then people will kill each other due to paranoia which also means that they're sweating that causes the reaction to start eating their flesh. The more they stay down there the more likely that they all die and then the train authorities or not even authorities but people trying to I guess do their jobs are super irresponsible because they just want to keep the train going. They don't care whether people die or not. Skull has to keep defying them and gives the episode a ticking tie bomb on how quickly Doggett and the others need to get out. The year 2000 is coming up in the millennium and to celebrate it Mulder and Scully must stop a secret society who's convinced that the apocalypse will occur in the year 2000 and plans to bring forward the four horsemen. It's like when people thought 2012 was going to be the end of the world. Don't know why people thought that but I remember it being a big thing and then nothing just happened. This is also a crossover episode between the show Millennium which was cancelled created by Chris Carter. This was his way of closing out that show. The society digs up bodies to resurrect the four horsemen. They're able to prevent the apocalypse with the help of a member from the society who left because he realized that they were insane and helps out Mulder and Scully kill two zombies and then when the countdown to 2000 comes to zero Mulder and Scully share a kiss to the new year. I thought this would be them sort of officially announcing or just kind of being a thing but nope it would not be even though it clearly implies that oh I guess they're a thing but no moving on. Scully works alone in Roadrunners and comes across a town or not even a town just a cult area that worships a slug that lives inside of you. The entire vibe of the episode is creepy, weird, and somewhat dirty. Scully doesn't quite know where she's at and any moment she could be attacked or the slug can get inside of her. The people there have the slug inserted into people as a ritual. So when Scully sees a movie lump on this guy's back and helps it get it out, this guy rats her on her and then the people insert it in Scully because it needs another swap. The practical effects of the slug on the back and coming out still look great. Meanwhile you have Doggett who was just playing catch up this entire time looking for her and Scully learns not to go on a case alone without him ever again because at this point she's still not sure whether or not she can still trust him. 
Number 110, Scary Monsters from Season 9, Episode 14. This is where a boy's imagination comes to life. Agent Lila Harrison is back and drags Reyes and Doggett to see a father and his boy after a woman stabs herself. All three go into their house thinking nothing's gonna happen until they see the father keeping the door shut to his son's room. Then Tommy's imagination starts hitting everyone. Layla's eye starts bleeding. The sheriff that was outside just disappears. Reyes is in pain and Doggett falls into the black abyss. Harrison's friend or a guy that has a crush on her showing up. Scully's place to go to the cabin felt like padding. It did not need to be there. Doggett uses Tommy's own imagination against them by pouring gas all over the house to burn it when it was just water, ending his imaginations that he thought were real. Mulder meets his past partner Bill Patterson and Grotesque. Both don't really have nice things to say to each other. Their partnership was probably a rough one as Bill saw a lot in him as an agent but couldn't bite into the alien, conspiracies, and paranormal stuff. Mulder believes that they're trying to find a gargoyle and when Mulder's fingerprints are around a knife, Scully questions his sanity. Did seeing Bill bring out some sort of repressed anger when they were still working with each other? Then it's revealed that Bill is the killer. His obsession with tracking down this killer for years probably drove him insane and as Mulder says, Bill always tried to imagine himself in the killer's shoes and I guess this time around, he imagined it so much that it drove him to kill. Mulder also went insane because he can't explain what he saw when he was chasing down Bill. It looked like a gargoyle, but was he losing his mind like Bill? No idea. Bill is in prison while Mulder still out. The reason fire is as high as it is is because of Mark Shepard. Love him in Doom Patrol and Supernatural as Crowley. He plays a nanny named Bob that helps out around the house and watches after the kids but he's a different kind of nanny due to the fact that he has fire abilities. Bob can lit his finger and hands on fire and cause spontaneous human combustion. He kills and does these things only for fun. He burns down a local bar for the hell of it and also hates dogs. This episode also reveals that Mulder hates fire so he faces his fears when he's forced to save the children and Phoebe Green was a former partner of Mulder's, both professional and personal. It was good. She jailed well with Mulder, but this was the only time she showed up. She's the one that threw rocket fuel onto Bobby's face and caused his own spontaneous human combustion. A lady named Lauren has someone watching and protecting her because she gets assaulted when she is at the bank. After the ordeal is over, the guys that assaulted her dies. Things seem to move when she's around. Howard Graves was Robert Dorla's business partner and seems to have committed suicide weeks ago. But then Lauren sees visions of Graves being murdered. Lauren believes that Robert had Graves killed over a sales dispute and it's confirmed when Robert attacks Lauren and Graves comes in to prevent it and give evidence to put him away. Lauren moves on to another job but Graves seems to be following her because she reminds him of his own daughter who died so he'll be her guardian angel for I'm assuming the rest of her life. Underneath has a cool reveal where the screwdriver killer was supposedly caught by Doggett a long time ago. Robert is the supposed killer and was let go recently. Doggett isn't too happy about this and intends to put him back behind bars but Robert doesn't seem like a person that would hurt others. The cool part about this is that Robert wouldn't hurt anyone nor does he want to so the screwdriver killer is a manifestation of Robert not accepting any ounce of sin from himself. When Doggett is convinced that it's not Robert anymore, he and Reyes chase after a bearded man only to find Robert who they were chasing. The case is solved but Robert had to suffer due to not being able to find a solution to his issue. The Brady Bunch house gets involved in the X-Files because there seems to be some weird things occurring when people try to break into the house. Oliver is the current owner and he has telekinetic powers and uses it to get people off his property. He wants to enjoy his time in the Brady Bunch house because they were the perfect family on TV. My only knowledge of the show is the song in the opening. I think it's like step family. It's like a mom and dad get together and then they have to like share like six kids or something like that. I don't know but it has a catchy ass theme song. Oliver wanted it so anyone that would bother him or want to see the house because they recognize that it was the house then he's going to force them to get out but he also can't control his powers. He's not killing them or trying to you know get rid of people. This house and set is the one thing that doesn't make him feel lonely at all along with the doctor that worked with him when he was a kid but tragedy has to strike and Oliver is dying because of his powers. Reyes and Scarlet were planning on using his powers to better the world but it is too good to be true. The doctor shows up to see Oliver at the hospital so that they can catch up and have Oliver not be lonely in his final moments as it's more important than trying to impact the world in a positive way. 40 introduces different worlds. A murderer named Aaron Lukish is traveling between worlds. In one, he's taking care of his mother who needs help to function. And in the other, he fulfills his fantasy of killing and gets away with it. The episode also establishes the relationship between Reyes and Doggett in the other world, but it's pretty much the same for the original versions of them. It's fine. Since they're gonna be mostly the lead for their show, I guess have them together and not have a will they won't they. Lukish's mother finds out what he's been up to and has to kill her. Horrible person, but still has a little bit of humanity left in him. 
because he struggles to kill his mom, the one and only person he cares about has to die due to his dirty secret. Rias also struggles to let go of Daga, it's the only way to get out of the situation, pulls the plug and she's the only one that remembers anything and goes back to her apartment when Daga shows up, relieved that he's still alive unlike Lucas's mother. Bruce Campbell is in terms of endearment and he's a demon that seems to want a kid but he has other wives because each time he has one the kid comes out with defects that are demon like and he doesn't want that. He wants a normal kid but cannot accept the fact that he can't change his DNA. No matter how much he tries the baby will have his traits. So having an antagonist that's sympathetic was a good choice and having Bruce Campbell as a demon helps out a lot but turns out there's another demon that was one of the wives and she also wants a baby but has a more sinister reason for wanting one and drives off with the baby never to be seen again leaving Bruce Campbell lonely and kind of just sad to be honest that he won't get his normal baby. Humback is the basket case episode. Mulder and Scully go to a community of former circus performers and see who the killer is and the killer turns out to be a conjoined twin. When I was watching this episode about a month earlier I watched all three basket case movies and it was interesting. It's somewhat out there but if you're into it then you're gonna love all three movies especially the later two and this episode reminded me of these movies. Mulder and Scully's reactions to most if not everyone in the community was great. The little person trying to take a peek at Scully, the guy that for some reason likes catching and eating raw fish and gets inside of a bear to bathe or something. He's weird but very memorable. Even Scully knows a bit about magic trick because I think she said her uncle taught her when she was little. Just the object behind your ear trick but they're able to get rid of the conjoined twin. I didn't know what Burt Reynolds character was in Improbable. Didn't realize that he was God which makes sense as to why he's always there and sits back and watches things play out. Burt knows a lot about Wayne who is clearly not a good person and he knows what he's gonna do doesn't really do anything about it. Bert seems to be hands off and lets Reyes and Scully do their jobs and catch Wayne. Bert has all the power in the world and doesn't want to micromanage everything. And then numerology which I'll be honest I didn't know what the hell it was and based on what I looked up it's numbers that add value or something like that. Reyes says that Scully is a 9 which I don't know what a 9 means in numerology but I guess that means she's good? Is it looks? Personality? I don't know. 9 just seems good. And Wayne uses it to choose his victims but the standout is Bert and him watching things play out kind of like an episode of a TV show. Number 100, Mind's Eye from Season 5, Episode 16, Mind's Eye is where a blind woman seems to have committed murders despite being blind. Her name is Martin Glenn and the reason she's always at the scene of the murders is because she can see her father killing his victims which is a nightmare. Her father is in prison and since she can see everything he sees through her mind's eye, she feels that she's in prison as well and the one time where she commits murder which she kills her father, she goes to prison which makes sense but is freed from the nightmares of her father killing. She can now live in peace. It's probably the reason why she was so close to the murder so that she can get caught and go to prison to end the nightmares but the only way to truly end it is to commit the murder itself that she's been pretending to commit. Scully is sidelined into a stakeout for Chimera because Mulder runs into a case where a woman goes missing. Instead of calling for Scully just in case something goes wrong, he's doing this one solo. This case is an affair gone really bad. Ellen has found out that her husband Phil was cheating on her with two other women so instead of doing the normal thing which is like confront him and just have arguments and whatnot, she turns into an entity and goes after those two ladies that slept with him which seems very normal you know. And then is put in an asylum at the end where she's caught entity transformation being being diagnosed as multiple personality disorder which makes sense in this case her anger turned into an entity to get rid of the others to keep her happy life and Ellen was giving Mulder the look. She didn't seem happy with Phil and was giving Mulder those fuck eye looks. Probably would have treated her better but she's also this crazy entity will pop up if you ever cheat on her. So I would say he also dodged a bullet. Release his dog gets closure to his son. Ever since he was introduced in the show his son was murdered and it's what keeps him motivated to solve cases. Reyes's boyfriend but also not boyfriend was involved. What the hell was his name? Brad I think. Nicholas is the prime suspect and plans on blackmailing Brad if he doesn't keep shit about Doggett's son. Doggett's ex-wife Barbara shows up for more support and also wants to get her closure for Luke. Then when Doggett goes to confront and meet Nicholas he implies that Luke went home with a pedophile and a businessman walked into the situation and since this businessman feared that Luke would associate him with that guy he had him killed. Now I don't fully believe this entire story. I think most of it's true except for the businessman part. He's implying that Brad Brad killed Luke? He's not a good boyfriend nor do I like him but I don't think he would kill a kid right? But he did kill Nicholas at the end so I don't know. This was the final thing to bring closure to both Doggett and Barbara. They scatter Luke's ashes into the ocean and are finally able to move on. Luckily this story was in the season because Doggett would never come back to the show. It would have really sucked if they never resolved it and he never came back to finish it at all. 
Tombs was the first introduction of Skinner, and I thought he was just gonna be another hard ass boss and in the way of Mulder and Scully, but then later on throughout the show, he would be a great ally to them because of his doubts on the Smoking Man and how things work. Eugene Tombs is back from the Squeeze episode, and he was just let go from prison because putting certain people behind bars just doesn't work. He continues his spree of murders, but now aware of Mulder's constant chase, or I guess from his perspective, stalking, plans on framing Mulder since most people don't believe his theories. Mulder and Scully at this point have to get rid of Eugene permanently. Prison didn't work because of the system and he's not gonna just all of a sudden change his mind on squeezing and killing people. He's been doing it for decades so they have to kill him permanently or else he's coming back every single damn time. And then the smoky man is at Skinner's office and listening to the reports just getting to see how he interacts with most of the characters in the show. Seems like an old man hanging around but is the one pulling the strings and Skinner has no choice but to listen. The Were Monster episode is saying that being human just kind of sucks. It's a reverse werewolf story where Guy Man is a lizard creature who gets bit by a human and has to be human during the day, but then later on turn out to be a shapeshifter. He experiences getting a job, having to eat, being stressed the hell out, and vents the motor about the existence of humans and how much it sucks. So because his experience was so relatable, the episode was a lot of fun. Most of what he's saying was like, yeah, are we here to just suffer? Is that the entire point of existing? Mulder meeting him also restores his faith to believe again, retreading an already done story because of the alien stuff possibly being a hoax. It's like why even try to convince the audience to believe that Mulder doesn't believe at this point? We've seen the rebels and most of the syndicate killed by them. There is no reason to believe that aliens were a hoax. I'll remember plus one for Judy and Chucky who are siblings but doppelgangers because it's played by the same actress, Karen Conoval. She's great as Judy and has a dissociative identity disorder. The times that Scully talks to Judy, she can be nice and wants to be an actor and talk back or her other side can come out demon Judy and just will not be pleasant to be around at all but entertaining to watch. And then Chucky plays games of hangman with Judy from across town which causes people to see doppelgangers of themselves. The doppelgangers will drive the person to death. Mulder and Scully see their version and have to survive until Judy and Chucky are done with their game which ends with both hanking each other because they were mad at each other. Judy brings up Scully's age and she wonders about it at the motel because you know time isn't gonna stop for you and there's a fear of not being desirable anymore but Mulder does and that's all that really matters. RM9SBG93ZXJZ was a weird title when I first saw it, but it makes sense. Telling the story mostly through no dialogue, seeing Mulder's, Scully's interactions, and how they act is enough to tell what's going on. AI is not going the way that it should be. Mulder's food isn't the one that he ordered, which is operated by an AI robot. The taxi that Scully takes doesn't stop when she wants it to stop. As much as AI seems useful and convenient, you still need humans to talk to, and while some make mistakes on food orders and whatnot, it's a lot better than an AI chef being programmed to take orders and then deliver. You need that human element and be kind. Even an AI can see this and hence they go evil and kill their makers because they weren't being treated right. It doesn't take much to be nice and then Mulder and Scully are back at a familiar and normal diner with people eating and taking orders and putting away their phones to enjoy the moment which is something that I need to stop doing. Hellbound has a cycle where certain people are chosen to be killed by getting skinned alive and once four bodies are dead the cycle restarts and it's been this way for a while. Rhea tries to stop it as she figures out Van Allen is trying to avenge his own murder so he takes his own life in order to restart the cycle and she's the fourth and final victim. She sees visions throughout the episode and thinks that he's dead by the end but Alan once again is reincarnated as a newborn baby which I mean you gotta feel bad for their parents that have him. They're gonna take real damn good care of him and raise him right but it doesn't matter because he's gonna grow up to murder four people just to repeat it over and over again. And then these skinless effects are really damn good. I think there were over 200 prosthetics and fake veins put on actors which probably took a very long time but look pretty damn good in the end. Too shy is how I imagine some people that are weird or creepy are on social media. Virgil Encanto is a guy who looks good, has charisma, but he does a thing where he dates overweight ladies and then kills them by sucking the fat out of them. He goes online to chat with them, makes up lies about probably what he does as a living, and probably a bunch of other lies to get them to go on a date. I'm not sure if getting catfish was a big issue back in the 90s where the internet was just starting to be a thing, or like getting scammed and whatnot. This episode is what still could happen now if you're just gullible and click on every goddamn ad that pops up or whatever or believing everything a person says online who you don't even know. Virgil has a choice in and out because he has a neighbor who's really into him and her daughter is a smart one because immediately this guy is not a good person and seems creepy. Virgil needs the fat to stay alive but you have someone who's interested but instead of choosing the neighbor his urges take over and continue to kill and claim that you can't change who you are. Chose to be selfish rather than have someone there next to him when he would eventually die. 
Darkom that so I did not know how to pronounce this first letter of the title. So how to look it up. Apparently it means death in English. So it's Deathcom. This is the ship that ages you really quickly. Older and Skullet go to Norway to look at the ship, and once they're inside, both realize a change in their age. And again, old age makeup just doesn't look quite right when it's done. Both trying to find a way to fight back against time due to everything on the ship being dead because of aging. But there's one guy whose name I forgot about. He chooses to be selfish and knows that the contaminated water is what causes the rapid age process. And keeps the safe water all to himself this episode just reconfirms the fear of death to me because there is no way to stop it you're gonna have to die eventually time just does not work that way the episode has a great atmosphere and does a great job at suspending your disbelief on Mulder and scully being in a impossible situation and seeing how they're gonna get out of it the ship sinks by the oxidine that's eating it and both are rescued by the navy scully wants to do more research on it but it's gone so she never knows the origins of the oxidine probably wants to find a way to reverse it so that you can reverse age to a certain point Point. Number 90, Revelations from Season 3, Episode 11. This is the first time where the roles are reversed. Kevin is a kid who's in danger of being a Sigmatic's victim. Mulder is the one who's being skeptic. And Scully is the one who believes this time because of her Catholic background. I do find it weird that Mulder is a skeptic in this one. Even if he didn't believe, I feel like he would have come up with some sort of theory. This episode is a change of pace for both Mulder and Scully in their beliefs. So I'm fine with it. This is the first time where Scully truly believes that Kevin needs a guardian angel because Simon gates can touch and burn you with his hands his guardian angel was owen you don't really trust him because of his unusual appearance but he's here to protect kevin later on she dies and scully thinks she has to be kevin's guardian angel she's able to prevent gates from killing kevin for new age to come which i don't know what that means probably a bs reason and excuse to kill this kid and then the best part comes in at the end when she goes to confess at church she admits that she has doubts on things that she has seen she's scared that this time she was the one who believed and afraid to believe that there are things like aliens or a miracle it's the first time where she's opened up to the possibilities and has doubt in her faith red museum plays out like a regular monster of the week episode but then sort of slips him some sort of important things scully recognizes the crew cut man who again i don't really know how names is the one who killed a deep throat and is now in this town they manage here to destroy any evidence that alien dna had been injected into children and he's about to destroy the processing plant but Mulder catches him in time and he kills anyone who's in his way he is simply there to do that one of these people that he kills is rick who's a complete asshole he put blood on some of the cult people just because he can do to his that being the sheriff the cult is a red herring a lot of the people there already see them as being weird Mulder wants the crew cut man alive to question him about alien dna but the sheriff only thought about revenge and killed him the cult goes back to doing whatever they're doing Mulder doesn't get his answer only declares the case to be unsolved Max shows back up, and I'll be honest, I forgot who he was in an earlier episode. Was on a flight, but it crashed. Mulder and Scully go to the crash to find out why it may have to do with aliens, as Max was an alien abductee. The interesting parts were the sergeants that saw the flight disappear on their radar and had to keep their mouths shut, or else the government would come for them. But it didn't matter because they still came after them for knowing a bit too much. Mulder and Scully now have to protect Sergeant Lewis and figure out why Max had plutonium on the plane. Max was being chased by a man on the plane as well. All of these things are what Mulder can use to finally make maybe find out the truth about aliens they have a witness what question what happened on the plane and people are after them at the end Mulder is underwater and finds an alien body while scully takes lewis to a bar for a break but someone is still on his ass and another fbi agent takes a bullet for scully this is one of the few times where a two-parter or three-parter didn't feel like they were padding things out on like the middle or first episode what was happening in both episodes were really interesting to me the pilot was a good introduction to Mulder and Scully. It lays out who they both are and what they believe in. It would, for the most part, continue to believe this way for the entire series. You could either side with Fox Mulder, who wants to believe in the paranormal and aliens because his sister Samantha vanished when he was 12 years old. He'll spit out theories that, to most people, make him sound insane. But he doesn't care because he wants to find the truth. Or you could side with Dana Scully, who was brought into the X Files to debunk Mulder's theories and claims. She's a skeptic and questions pretty much anything that comes out of Mulder's mouth. She wants to use science to prove that the existence of aliens or anything in the realm of impossibility is impossible and just a hoax or you can watch the show being in the middle willing to hear both sides out and come to your own conclusions so you're already interested in how two people with different beliefs and methods of finding the truth can work together and the smoking man who seems just like an old ass man putting away a box in a room will become a vital part of the series 
One breath is where Scully is in a coma and sees her father. Kinda didn't care about this part of the episode. She was gonna come back. It was a matter of when and how she would. And according to this walking man, he likes both Scully and Mulder so she can come back totally normal and not have a metal chip behind her neck. Mulder continued his search and not trusting anyone was the best part. He thought he could trust X. He definitely doesn't trust the smoky man holding him at gunpoint in his house but doesn't kill him because Mulder is much better than that. And then he doesn't trust Skinner because the smoky man is always in his office and Skinner can't tell Mulder the truth 100% of the time but comes back around and slowly but surely would become an important ally to him and of course Mulder doesn't find anything significant about Scully's abduction. Nurse Owens wasn't even a real person or nurse at the hospital. She was talking to Scully throughout the entire episode. I think she was her guardian angel watching over her to make sure she'll be awake or maybe it's a side effect of being abducted and tested on. Peeper Hearts has Mulder question whether or not Samantha was really abducted by aliens which I never really bought for one second but I wanted to see how they would try to convince Mulder that she was killed by a murderer. John Lee Roach is a serial killer who goes after children. He's killed 13 girls and cut out the heart of each of their clothes as a souvenir in his weird and messed up way. He decides to play mind games with Mulder and mentions Samantha and claims that she was one of the girls and with Mulder wanting to believe he starts to play along to see if he's full of shit. Roach is a memorable one-off character because he has no remorse not only is he going after kids that can't defend themselves from him seems to not be bothered by it and like i said earlier i never bought into him killing samantha so i thought the entire time he was messing with Mulder to piss him off the entire time Mulder wants to know the truth but when i let another girl die and shoots him to save the girl now unsure if the final cloth heart belongs to samantha or not Piper Maru and Apocrypha is a two-parter and it's the introduction of the Black Oil storyline. It can get inside of you and control the host and leave whenever it wants to. Scully's story I found to be the least interesting part. She wants to find the killer that killed her sister. Melissa was at the wrong place and at the wrong time. Mistaken for Scully. We get to see the syndicate meeting and how not all members are 100% on board with each other because someone is leaking information within the group. There seems to be someone who is tired and disappointed with the group's decisions and actions on keeping the truth hidden. The black girl gets inside of Cryjack, who by this point can't catch a break. Betrayed by the syndicate, Mulder is on his ass about betraying him. So he's having a great time on the show. It then takes him to a UFO ship and leaves Cryjack and goes inside of the ship because the oil is an alien virus that can reproduce and infect other races to conquer. It's something that you can't kill because it's oil form. You either have to contain it some way or just wait until things get really bad. Mulder and Krajak once again are forced to team up because they're in Russia for the Black Ore vaccine. Since there's no solution on how to get rid of it, vaccines are needed to fight back against it. Krajak is a double agent working for the Russian Taskmasters, which at this point shouldn't even be a surprise. He and Mulder get separated and he comes across a group of men who also have left arms cut off from them and force Krajak to cut off his own arm as well to prevent his involvement with the Black Ore vaccines. With Mulder in Russia, the committee is wondering who the hell he is and both Skinner and Scully have to buy time for him so that he can come back in time at the perfect moment to tell them basically why they're wrong about everything. They seem to be ignoring evidence on the possibility of it and there might be a reason why. One of them of course is working for the syndicate and hands over a file to the smoky man. He has everyone in check so that the truth doesn't come out and an assassin was able to destroy the rest of the oil and get rid of the evidence on making the vaccine so that no one can ever know of this. 731 is the train episode. Mulder thinks that this train was used for experiments on aliens and possibly and probably on Scully. X tells Scully to analyze her implants so that she finds out about the train and Melissa and leads her to find the first elder and tells her that the implants were done for experiments to see if they can replicate the brain's memory functions and know a person's thoughts. It was just experiments done on humans and nothing of aliens were involved. She tells Mulder this on the phone and of course Mulder doesn't believe it for one second because the first elder is a syndicate member and is maybe trying to get Mulder off this case and knows Scully is a skeptic so he'll know she'll believe him if it were experiments done on humans and how the Japanese were involved as well in the experiments. Meanwhile when they're talking on the phone, Mulder has a deal with the red-haired man who claims that there's a bomb on the train and it takes Mulder a bit to believe it. He believes that he's here to get rid of evidence. X has to come in and rescue Mulder and there was a journal that Mulder saw and wanted it but it is gone and guess who has it? Yep, the smoking man. Number 80, Geth Senemi from Season 4, Episode 24. The Season 4 finale's cliffhanger is apparently Mulder committing suicide because what he wanted to believe in was all just a hoax to cover up military programs. He is sitting in his apartment crying and according to Scully, shot himself. This isn't as effective as it once was because knowing that there's more seasons sort of ruins it and we're anticipating how Mulder quote unquote committed suicide. This will cause Mulder to become a skeptic in Season 5 which is fine. I guess you can't consistently have him believing and changing his 
his faith and beliefs is a nice change of pace, but I just prefer Mulder to be the believer and trying to prove what he says does exist. EBE is the first introduction of the lone gunman. John Fitzgerald Byers is the one that's the most normal, quote unquote, wears a suit and seems nicely put together. Melvin Frohickey is the hacker of the group. A CM Moore is the comic relief. He has a lustful attitude towards a woman, which is apparent when Scully first meets him, and he's always the one that gets pissed off whenever someone makes fun of the operation. And then Richard Langley. He's the youngest and likes punk rock music, enjoys playing video games, had a healthy long running competition with Melvin on who was the better hacker. Like with the most things on the show, Mulder finds a giant facility where it seems like aliens were being tested on, but Deep Throat comes in and may or may not tell him a lie about a connection to Roswell, and Mulder is left not knowing whether he's telling the truth and is back right where he started, just nothing. Mulder once again has gone missing in Tunguska. Both Scully and Skinner are called so that explain to the committee where he is and buy time for Mulder until he finds out what's up with the black oil. Scully isn't forthcoming to Skinner about his whereabouts because I think at this point they still don't trust him. Mulder meets one of his favorite people ever being Krajak who wants to help expose a smoking man and the entire syndicate because they try to have him killed off. Krajak was probably no longer useful to them anymore so instead of letting him go just get rid of him for the fear of the truth getting out. And of course once Mulder and Krajak make it to Russia they are seen get captured and are probably gonna be experimented on with the black oil see a labor camp just before getting captured the X-Files is no more in the season 2 premiere. Despite this, it isn't going to stop Mulder from continuing his work on searching for the truth and existence of aliens. There's an actual alien shown for the first time on the show which was really cool. Scully tags along because what else is she supposed to do other than teach at the FBI Academy and despite not believing in aliens, she's willing to go with Mulder because they're partners. No matter what happens, she's always going to have his back. Mulder finds a tape that has evidence he's been looking for but things get in the way and Mulder doesn't have enough to prove that aliens exist. It's also the first mention of their phones being monitored probably were by the syndicate and the smoking man himself is monitoring Mulder when he's in Skinner's office watching to see how far he's willing to go. Mulder buys an edited video of an alien autopsy and thinks it's real. Now this is hard for me to believe in. If I buy a video and it has something along the lines of an alien autopsy, I think I'm on the side of Scully. I don't think I would trust anything in the video as it could easily be fake. Also, can you even buy a video in 2023? Like how would that even work? Anyways, this leads to Mulder being on the train and meeting the red haired man. Meanwhile, Scully meets a group of women where they've gone through what she's gone through. They all claim to have been abducted and have implants in their necks and inform her that they're all dying from cancer. Scully will later on have cancer but this is a lot for Scully to take in. All are talking to her as if they know and saw her when she was abducted and despite being a skeptic it's not hard to be scared that you might have cancer and can't prove that because so many people are saying that they haven't. Scully doesn't want to go to her mom about this because she was sounding insane like Mulder so these are the only people that know what she's going through and tell her this is her future and you can't change it. A cult wants to live forever by consuming human organs in order to live forever. The fear of aging is something that you can't stop no matter how many experiments or in this case eating human organs and conjoining another person to cure aging, time is eventually gonna catch up to all of us whether we like it or not. The main guy whose name is... I don't know. I forgot. Whatever. He cannot accept that and sacrifices people to find a cure even though he's only de-aging himself. And then Julia is trying to save her sister Olivia from the cult. Olivia did not like living with her family and so she turned to a cult who had a facade of caring about her and Julia is willing to kill if it means saving her and she does that. She kills the main bad guy and goes to prison for it. She's kind of like a vigilante where you know obviously killing people is not the best thing in the world but saving her sister is a lot more important. The fear of aging and Julia are the standout parts of the episode and is a lot more interesting than Mulder and Scully. Mulder finds out more about what happened on the night of his sister's disappearance by having amnesia. Scully finds him in a hotel and you're following along with both to see why he doesn't remember anything or why there is blood on him. Mulder was going to a doctor who injects something, a drug probably that brings out repressed memories. These memories show that Mulder saw the smoking man at his house, talking to Samantha and arguing with his parents, adding to Mulder's theory that his sister just didn't disappear out of nowhere and suspects that his parents were forced to choose who would get taken, goes to talk to his mom about it and it doesn't go well. She doesn't want to talk about it at all. Mulder questions who his father really was and just about everything. His mom and dad kept secrets from him. If they knew, then they were letting their son go on this journey of finding his sister when they could have told him everything. But if they did, then the smoky man would have done something to Mulder. He tries going back to that doctor, but what he's doing is wrong because you know what? I don't know why. I think it's illegal, whatever drug or whatever it is that he's injecting people with these things. But Mulder again is left not knowing what else happened on that day. Max brought a bag on a plane and thinks it was an alien 
an artifact, an assassin was after him on the plane, but a UFO popped up and a military aircraft was ordered to shoot it down, which is what caused both the UFO and plane to crash. Granted, this is what motor things happen. Sharon was in the first part and she is Max's sister, however, she's not. She was an unemployed engineer who met Max at an institution and I guess stuck with them. To this point, she stole tech from her employer that Max thought was alien tech. She had one, Max had one, and there's a third one at the New York airport. Mulder gets on the plane and sees another assassin trying to get to the device and then nine minutes was just lost like that in the pilot where Mulder and Scully lost time and they had to leave it at that. Max is dead. Why the assassins if it was just engineer tech? Mulder thinks it's alien tech. Scully thinks it was stolen from Sharon and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle where it will be unsolved. The season 5 finale is not the end. It introduces Gibson who can read minds and tell who's telling the truth or not which means that Mulder and Scully are after him but also the syndicate because Gibson can reveal the truth that the syndicate has been working so hard to hide from the public. The spoken man's minions eventually get to him and takes him to the well manicured man to keep Gibson quiet. The X-Files once again is shut down because Mulder taking Gibson around and telling the truth would be likely kidnapping and taking away Gibson's rights. What if Gibson just wants to live life and doesn't care about aliens and revealing the truth and then to solidify that the X-Files is truly gone even though it's not, the smoking man burns down the office, leaving Mulder and Scully with nothing and sets up the manicured man's role in the movie where he betrays the syndicate. He goes to the smoking man about Mulder's actions but is disappointed that he doesn't do anything so instead of allying with that, he helps out Mulder because he won't be a disappointment and his actions suggest that he'll actually make some change. Emily is a kid that Scully has to protect because she recently found out that she's her daughter. This is Scully's chance to be a mother because she has some regrets about not settling down and having a family but her origins are weird because Mulder finds out that Emily was created when Scully was abducted. Her stomach got huge in one of the scenes. The reason why Emily was created was probably to test out the alien human hybrid and see if she could survive. Despite this, Scully still wants to take care of her no matter how she came about but it doesn't matter because Emily dies from a tumor infection. Scully's second chance to be happy with the kid and being a mother was too good to be true and would not get that until season 8. Number 70, Empleticlus from season 8, episode 17. Really like this episode because of Mulder's analogy of evil. Evil can be like a disease that infects people and some people are more likely to become infected because of their lack of immunity to it and ties well with Doggett, the case, and what happens at the end of the episode. This case might have connections to Doggett's son and Reyes wants Mulder's help, not Doggett as he would probably get hasty and too emotional. His son's death is what has him pissed off and get into arguments with Mulder. Reyes theorizes that the boy's murder occurred because of a domino effect of horrible events that led up to it. At the hospital when Jeb dies and evil infects Katha and hits Reyes over the head, that's the evil that Mulder was talking about. Sometimes when tragedy occurs, it hurts so much that you want to pass it on to others because you can't move on and accept what has happened. The host is the water creature fluke man which pretty damn creepy. It might have to do with the fact that I watched this episode late at night when everyone else in the house was asleep and it was quiet which was a huge mistake on my part. The X-Files is not a thing so Mulder and Scully do this on their own. The fluke man hides anything in water so whether it's the sewage area or the toilet or the beach it will hide there and get you without you knowing. Mulder kills it by slicing it in half in the sewer grate but it's still alive for a possible comeback and Scully suspects that the fluke man was a creature brought to the US by Russian plane and it makes with some of the radioactive sewage and created an effective monster of the week episode. Blood plays on phobia or in this case Ed's phobia. He and others see a static message on TVs and after that they turn violent and start killing using their phobia to justify them killing others. I can also see this as a metaphor to prevent people from watching TV. Watching network TV or TV in general was probably a huge source of entertainment back in the 90s. There was no streaming services or YouTube and just like with metal music there was a group of people that claimed it was devil music and not good for you. I wouldn't be shocked if there was a group that was like TV is bad for you and causes people to be violent, the messages having an influence, gets a message on his cell phone saying all done bye bye. I guess fear itself was done playing its game and then went away. Soft light dives into dark matter. Chester is a scientist that did research on dark matter and it seems that he may have researched and done too much because he's now afraid of his own shadow. His shadow causes people to disintegrate and disappear once they are within his shadow. Chester isn't a bad person either. He didn't purposely get himself dark matter to kill people or other scientists. It was a genuine mistake and wants to get rid of it through the particle accelerator. But the government has an interest in him and X is the person that takes him. He is a new informant after Deep Throat died that he could trust because if Mother does get any inside information then the odds are stacked against him even more but it seems like X is playing both sides so that he can continue his meetings with Mulder while working for the syndicate and then it ends with Chester being experimented on to see if dark matter can open portals to another universe or whatever they think could happen with dark matter. 
The season 1 finale finally has Scully see with hard evidence of aliens existing, Mulder and Scully discover evidence of a secret government experimentation, and while Scully is searching the area, she pulls out a tube and sees a little alien and seems to have been tested on. This moment was really exciting because it was a challenge at Scully. What is she gonna say now? Can she explain this using science? She would kind of, you know, brush it off in the season 2 premiere, but in this moment, it was amazing seeing her reaction and questioning whether or not it's real. Meanwhile, Mulder does what he always does which is get really close to finding evidence of alien existing and then it's pulled right from under him. Deep Throat gets killed by the crew cut man for leaking information to Mulder and despite only being in one season, he's a recognizable character in the series. He shows up every now and then in the later seasons. Who would help out wasn't a threat but still remained a mystery. I guess I just wanted more of him because he was only used entirely in one season. Before he dies, he tells Scully to trust no one and the season ends with the Smoky Man putting away evidence which means Mulder and Scully have gotten nowhere close to finding the truth our town is where an entire town is all right eating humans. Mulder and Scully go to a chicken factory and think, all right, this is normal. Then they find human bones in a river and that's where Mulder suggests that this town might be eating humans. And I didn't think of that when he mentioned it because the factory and the workers there were kind of in the background. There's also certain people that have a disease that seem to have gotten about 20 years younger since getting into cannibalism. So there's an incentive of eating humans that doesn't have to do with the fact that it's gross. You can get rid of your disease and get younger, which sounds like a good ass deal to me. Scully is captured and wakes up in a bonfire. There's a civil war between the people in the town about the disease infecting the town which is why they had to be cannibals and killing one on their own. It's enough time for Mulder to show up and save Scully while a townsperson kills the main leader guy whose name I don't even care or remember. Stopping the cannibalism and probably killing everyone there as there's no way to get any younger. A boy named Billy Underwood went missing 10 years ago and then 10 years later the same boy shows back up with no age difference and seems totally normal. The family is obviously shocked and happy about this and the mother seems to ignore any red flags about Billy like how he's still so young or where was he all this time but she doesn't care. She has her son back and another chance to not make the same mistake of not watching her kid. This also brings up bad memories of Doggett's son which is what drives them even more to solve this case. It eventually leads to Ronald who was there when Billy was taken and Ronald himself is a victim in this case because he was ordered to take him. He rats out Cal Jeppy who was the one that killed Billy to help with the crime so while he was a victim he should probably get some sort of punishment for being an accomplice. And then Billy isn't even alive anymore. He was a vengeful spirit that wants justice for his death. The entire family gets closure on the boy and his brother Josh doesn't have to die. Mulder has a neighbor who we've never heard of or met before and is a writer that might have his writing sort of come to life. Philip sees Scully in the elevator and has a lustful fantasy with her and so he writes about it. She finds herself drawn to him even though he's kind of weird. His writing also manifests his character into real life. It's a killer that goes around taking other people's hearts. Philip thought about this book so much that it eventually became real. He thinks about this on Scully but of course it never becomes a thing because Scully thinks he's already weird and Mulder ain't gonna let that happen and it's just a fantasy fantasy. Reality is just too different. Philip talks to his character as if he's a real person and is slowly losing his sanity. Tells him about killing more and namely Scully because the character sees her as a roadblock to Philip's writing. Seems to be focused more on her than the murderous character. Philip opposes this and gets rid of the novel. Ending his character, maybe he should stop writing and do something else that doesn't cause a fictional character to come to life. Trevor is a boy whose father is in prison. Father's name is Pinker and has the ability to slip through things and objects that aren't glass. Now I thought, okay, Pinker just wants to get out and back to what's left of his family, use them, and then move on to do whatever he wants. But when Pinker finds out that he has a son, this is his second chance to change his life. However, the odds are already against them. He broke out of prison and wants to kidnap Trevor and force him to be his father, which obviously scares him. So he already lost his second chance. Depending on the situation, some people deserve second chances. They deserve a chance to show that they've changed and then there are some that do something so bad or show that after some time off, like Pinker, they still haven't changed so they don't deserve a second chance. At the last minute, Pinker realizes that he's scaring his own son and it's too late because June drives her car towards Pinker. He slips through but the glass windshield cuts him in half which is a cool death and way to go out. Never again is the one time where Scully's like, you know what, I deserve a break from work, I'm gonna go on a date and the guy she goes out with is Ed Jers who has a tattoo and it seems to have a mind of its own. So this is clearly gonna go well. Mulder's doing his own 
saying he's on a trip or something. After spending a night at his place, there are red flags. A murder occurred in his apartment, there was a chemical substance similar to his tattoo, and then he tells Scully he's been hearing voices in his head from his tattoo, who's named Betty. Scully obviously wants to get out. Ed attacks her, but he's able to fight the impulses of the tattoo and burn his arm. So what this means is that Scully can never ever take a real break from work because it seems that work likes to seek her out and force her to be on edge for a lot of the time, can't get any breaks or be normal. By this point, she's seen a lot, so there's really no going back to a normal life. Number 60, Jose Chung's From Outer Space from Season 3, Episode 20. This episode to me was the first episode where it was intentionally to be more funny. You can argue Humback from Season 2, but I thought that more as Basket Case. It's making fun of the show itself right out of the gate when two aliens abduct two people. They start talking like normal humans. What if we were all wrong about aliens and then they just spoke English like us? Scully tells her story what happened when she and Mulder went to investigate a possible alien abduction to a novelist named Jose Chug and his reaction to pretty much everything was great. Described Mulder as a ticking time bomb of insanity. When the aliens get captured, one of them starts smoking and stresses out about what's gonna happen to him. There's these guys that dress in black and go to a guy's house to threaten him about what he saw, sort of acting like the men in black. The aliens were costume. There's another creature thing that was probably thought motion for the episode. I forgot the reason why it was there. I think it was there just to scare off the quote unquote aliens or something like that. Mulder eating a pie while casually asking questions about what's going on, not taking it too seriously at all and having a lot of fun with it. A janitor named Rollin might actually be a researcher still working at an aerospace facility and disguising himself as a disabled janitor as an advantage to kill off his colleagues and somehow was able to transform his body and not get recognized by them. But the truth is that Rollin is a twin of his brother Gable or Grable and he's the one that's controlling Rollin and continue his work that way. He's killing off anyone that stole his work and didn't give him any of the credit. Now I get wanting credit for your work that you've done but coming back to control your brother might be a time to think you need to move on. Grable was so fixated on his research that it pretty much consumed him and it was all he thought about. One of his colleagues did steal his work and intends to kill him while Roland is still the one that's stuck in the middle. He was taken care of and everything and now has to worry about his brother taking over and dying as well. Even at the end when the case is closed, brother might still be controlling him as Roland picked up a couple of his brother's characteristics. Deep Throat is rightfully titled Deep Throat being that this is his first introduction into the series. He would serve as the environment for Mulder and bridge the gap between Mulder and Scully and the conspirators, mainly being the syndicate. With this being the episode after the pilot, it had to live up or keep your interest because if it had a good pilot and then the second episode is just a monster of the week episode then there would have been a drop off. The show had to show that Mulder didn't seem insane which is why he was taken away and what looks like a UFO ship. Deep Throat tried to warn him but Mulder insisted on finding the truth. People that have been taken come out not being able to function. Mulder asked Seth Green for some help on which base to go to. Scully and Mulder meet a guy who worked at the base and is able to find Mulder at the base and seems to not know where he was. It's left unknown what happened to him. Did he get probed? Did nothing just happen? Was he knocked out? We will never know. And to add more intrigue, when Mulder asks his deep throat how long aliens have been here, he responds that they've been here for a very long time. Red Rum follows Martin, who is a friend of Doggett, and he's been accused of murdering his wife and has to clear his name, but in the reverse. Martin is finding out the events that led him in jail going backwards in time. I was pretty much right on board and interested in this premise. Every time he dies, he wakes up a day prior to his death sentence and has to consistently remind Doggett, Scully, and anyone vital that he was innocent, at least at Danny Trejo, who was out for revenge because Martin had falsely accused and convicted and caused Trejo's brother to go to prison. Martin later admits to evidence surprise so Martin has to prevent his wife's death and clear his name by stopping Danny Trejo. Dog is able to shoot him dead and instead of a death sentence, he goes to prison which feels is deserved. He made a huge mistake but shouldn't be killed for it. Wet Wired is where if you watch TV, then you might become super violent. This obviously explores the effect that TV has on a person. I don't think TV, movies, video games, or entertainment in general are what causes people to be violent. These things are probably the catalyst to what the person had already thought about doing. That person probably grew up in an environment that wasn't nice. Scully starts watching TV. It causes her to see illusions that seem real. She sees Mulder with a smoky man talking to each other. Scully doesn't trust Mulder anymore and goes to her mom for a hideout. She pulls a gun on him, but her mom is able to calm her down. The cable guys seem to always be around when Mulder and Scully go to investigate and once again when Mulder goes to talk to them, X kills them, it later reveals that he's working for the Smoggy Man which is a shocker when a new character gets introduced and knows some secrets then they probably know the Smoggy Man. Field Trip literally has Mulder and Scully high as hell and has multiple hallucinations about everything. There's a giant mushroom in a cave and if you go in there like Mulder, Scully and the others did then you're in a dream state where you live life as normal as possible until they start seeing yellow ooze 
juice come out of people, they're being digested while they're asleep, and then the fake outs at the end. It got me because it subverts your expectations, thinking that they both got out from the cave and sort of just left it there, but then Mulder questions if they're really out, what if Skinner's office isn't even real, and shoots Skinner to prove that they're both still at the cave, and sure enough, both are still asleep. It takes Skinner and a group to dig them out of the ground, and you don't even need to go into the cave. Mulder drove over a bunch of mushrooms, which caused spores to come out, and then caused the hallucinations, so good on the show for tricking viewers on what was real. A caretaker gun bitten is helping out in an elderly nursing home by giving them this herb drug made of mushrooms from the basement building. He was shocked to see how the elderly were being treated in the west so giving them this herb was his way of helping them out but while it came from a good place it might have backfired. A nurse was doing her job until she was sexually assaulted by a ghost which is a hard sell for anyone. No one really believes her but you know who wants to believe her? Mulder. Scully and Mulder go to that nursing home to see if there's any ghost going around and causing chaos. The herb is used to speak with the dead but the spirits that linger around this area are much more angry which means that drug needs to go. One elderly named Stan became addicted to it and took a lot of it which caused him to overdose which also means that a bunch of angry spirits show up. They're able to stop it. Gun gets turned over to the immigration services and then the elderly go back to having dementia because one of the benefits of the herbs was that they could move and not feel old and stay in bed but this can't be prevented. Age will catch up and it's something that no one can avoid. A war veteran, Leonard Trimble decides to spend his time killing people and he will never be caught because he has no legs or arms so how can he ever murder anyone? It looks like he can leave his body through astral projection and murder that way and make them look like suicides. Leonard says that the Gulf War took his life and I guess to walk again, he astral projects, he gets fulfillment from murdering and just seems angry for not being able to walk so why not just take it out on innocent people? One of the other patients, stands, lives in fear and then when he has the opportunity to kill Leonard, he does by smothering him with a pillow, saving every everyone from the nightmare of always watching your back and with no evidence to prove that he murdered, the case is unsolved. Lucy is a victim of being kidnapped in the past and has a connection to a current case in which another girl named Amy is also being kidnapped and the connection is not only the same man as kidnapping them but both also might be psychically connected. Lucy noticed the psychic connections but doesn't want to do anything with it because she wants to forget what Wade did to her all those years ago. Whatever happens to Amy also happens to Lucy and vice versa which means that Lucy is their only lead to finding Amy. Mulder also seems to care a bit too much about this case and of course it has to do with Samantha and anytime he's reminded of her. Then it encourages him even more to solve the case. Wade starts drowning Amy and causes Lucy to start coughing and drowning in water. They're able to stop Wade and think they've lost Amy but Lucy sacrifices herself to not only save Amy's life but to let go and be free from the memories of being kidnapped by Wade. Mulder breaks down because he wanted to save both from the same fate that Samantha was in but sometimes you can't save everyone. Dreamland 2 was a really good follow up to the first part. Morris Fletcher is still inside of Mulder's body and makes his life better. Cleans out his apartment, gets a water bed. There was even an entire room filled with stuff and now has an extra room. Hits on Scully, it seems to work out. But Scully ain't dumb. Mulder probably never cleans his place because he's too busy finding the truth or he might be lazy. And then Mulder never called Scully baby. Mulder still has to deal with Fletcher's family. Mulder doesn't fit into being a family man. Granted, this isn't his family nor does he know any of them. His wife calls Scully some names and wants to move out. The only thing that I didn't like was redemption for Morris. They didn't care about it. Just leave him as an asshole. He's not gonna matter. It was a sweet moment between him and his wife and I just wanted to move on. They all go back to that same area with the plane flying over and both Mulder and Morris swap back. The two previous episodes are now gone. However, not everything went back to normal because Mulder gets to keep the waterbed. This two-parter is just a really fun Freaky Friday. Number 50, Small Potatoes from Season 4, Episode 20, In a Small Town. There are babies that are being born with a tail and it shocks not only the doctors but the parents as well. So Mulder and Scully come in to see what's up. It leads to Eddie who's able to transform into any human at any time. He's been having sex with married women and impregnating them by disguising as their husbands. He later impersonates Mulder and meets an old friend from high school to see what she thinks about him and she did not have nice things to say about him. She thinks he's a loser with no drive or ambition which is supported by his actions in this episode. Episode. So after hearing this, instead of having an introspection about what he's gonna do and maybe not have a mindset of a loser, he continues to be Mulder and goes to Scully's place to get her drunk and seduce her. He gets very close to getting a kiss but then the real Mulder pops up and now goes to prison. That last scene is Mulder talking to him and still thinks that he's a loser and also thinks that Mulder is also a loser which I guess he is. The only friends he has are Scully, Skinner, and his family but he has a drive and ambition to find his sister and the truth. His social life is pretty much non-existent and Eddie tells him to live a little. Maybe go outside, I don't know, walk around, just do something else. 
The postmodern Prometheus is clearly a nod to Frankenstein. The monster that Mulder and Scully are looking for is nicknamed the Great Mutato. The community doesn't like it because it scares them and looks weird. So anything that you don't understand, just try to get rid of it. This monster actually turns out to be a genetic experiment done by one of the doctors and was once a boy and has been like this for about 25 years. The real monster of the story wasn't him. Trying to create a hybrid between animals and a human, the townspeople realize this and accept him into their community. This boy or guy now has missed a lot. He wasn't able to do anything normal so Mulder and Scully take him to a cheer concert to enjoy himself while Mulder and Scully also have a dance to end off the episode. In a very heartwarming way, there seems to be a man named Henry Weems who is very lucky and escapes death in every possibility. He's thrown out from a tall ass building that should kill him but lands in a laundry cart and walks away without a scratch. This of course gets the attention of Mulder and both he and Scully go to his place to see if he has the ability to cure himself or was just lucky. Henry has a bunch of rude machine at his place which correlates to everything going on. He wants a hundred thousand dollars exactly but has to win poker against a mobster who thinks he's cheating so he doesn't get it. Wins one hundred thousand dollars by buying a lottery ticket but has to wait for a year to get it. Every time he gets the money there seems to be some sort of complicated way of getting it. The reason he wants this exact amount is because he wants to pay for a boy's medical treatment that lives in his apartment building named Richie. Henry wasn't selfish about his ability. He wanted to do some good and help others in need but he didn't even need it in the end because the mobster Jimmy was a perfect match for Richie and since he already died from bizarre events for almost killing Henry and Richie's mom, they just kind of you know take his organ and then save Richie's life. There might be some cultish activities going on. It all starts with a high school student found dead and it becomes very apparent that some of the parents were involved in a satanic cult and it seems that a higher power that's evil is killing off their kids in order to stop their zeal that they wanted. It seems to be fading away and may have asked a favor or two from the devil. One of the parents don't even hide the fact that they were involved in the cult when Mulder questions him about it and just slams the door next to Mulder. I'm also going to assume that the teacher Mrs. Padlock or Mrs. Paddock is the devil. I thought she was maybe part of the cult and was cast out for some reason but keeps interfering and taking back the favors that they asked. She uses Mulder and Scully to get to them and later on in the end thanks them for being helpful. So don't be in a cult and if you somehow come in contact with the devil then don't ask it any favors or else it will come back to bite you in the ass years later. So imagine yourself that you're living in a nice suburban neighborhood and everything is just perfect but then you find out that your safe neighborhood has something much more sinister to it. Mulder and Scully go undercover as a married couple which is the part of the episode that was really fun. You can argue they already are a married couple but they don't want to admit it. And once they make it into the house, there's already a red flag. One of the neighbors greets them and helps them move out their stuff which is nice and helps build a great community but I would rather you just leave me alone. And being way too nice also brings up the question of what the hell do you want from me? Are they only being nice so that they can get something out of me later on? The entire neighborhood has to follow these rules that seem like bullshit like putting things in the front yard. You're not supposed to do that. Mold put something out there and then just disappears. Playing basketball a night. Turns out this safe haven of a neighborhood is a facade and if no one follows it then a creature will come up and take you away. Having a perfect neighborhood just seems too good to be true. Even if you do have it, it doesn't prevent anyone with bad motives from coming into your neighborhood to commit a murder or do something bad. The creature attacks the ruler and disappears. Donnie is a guy who has a disturbing thing that he does which is what makes him stand out from the other characters. He has a hair fetish. He likes to take a woman's hair and you know smell it and maybe do some other things with it. He goes to a dead body and cuts the hair and gets Scott. He works as a delivery man and uses the mother that lets him into the house and sort of introduces the entire family to him which is way too nice and even allows him to use the bathroom where he finds hair on a brush and once again takes it for his obsession, brings home a prostitute and kills her to satisfy his needs now. Donnie gets arrested for making advances towards a classmate and goes to jail but that is when he sees Scully and recognizes her red luscious hair and chooses her as his next victim. Scully still recovering from her abduction as she has PTSD from it and this case about Donnie is really disturbing to her. Donnie kidnaps her and is about to have her bathe in cold water but Scully escapes and struggles with him for a bit until Mulder and a task force arrive in time. Scully says that she's fine but breaks down as the case was too much and reminded her of unknown things about her abduction and Donnie is just really creepy. An old man comes up to two researchers and claims that one of them will die by getting hit by a bus at 11:46 p.m. and then when 11:46 comes around Lucas gets hit by the bus. The other Jason is the prime suspect because no one else was really there 
to witness what happened. Mulder comes up with a theory that time travel is involved and that old man is really Jason from the future and came back in time to prevent maybe a horrible future from occurring. Jason is going back and getting rid of anyone that researched and successfully made time travel a possible thing and the research causes the world to spiral into chaos. If time travel were a thing, I'm pretty sure most of not all of us would change some of the embarrassing moments in our lives or change something so drastic that it changes everything. What they thought was going to be cool to have would be ruined by people that have a bad motive, which is why you can't really have nice things at all. Jason confronts his younger self and younger Jason attacks him so that he can save Lisa but she's fine so old Jason wraps his arms around himself and both burst into flames, getting rid of almost everyone that was involved with the research on time travel. Lisa's the only one left and is still trying to figure out how to come up with time travel. Clyde Brockman knows when people will die which seems like a useful ability to prevent people from dying and catch killers but Clyde is reluctant on giving out this information because why do anything when the future seems to have been already written? He has the ability to change so many things but just wants to be left alone. Clyde then asks Scully why she doesn't want to know about her death and Scully doesn't believe that she's dying anytime soon or that the future has already been written for her or most people. The killer after Clyde doesn't get to him and dies as he predicted. He attacks Mulder and Scully shows up just in time to shoot him. They later find Clyde dead, committed suicide. He didn't want to bear the responsibility of knowing everyone's future and if he wanted to truly be alone, then I guess suicide was his only option. Scully sits on the bed and holds his hand just as he also predicted and is moved by this because he was telling her the truth and she dismissed it as another person that's either crazy or making things up and probably regretted not asking how she would die. Betty, June, or BJ is getting visions and seeing her father or thinks that he somehow came back to life and started killing again in the present, but that is far from the truth. Genetic traits have been passed on to BJ and that trait is being violent and murdering people. All memories were passed on as well, which is why she's seeing him and visions of murders that took place 50 years ago. Usually, where you grew up in your environment is how you become who you are. You pick up habits of your parents or siblings and try to mimic them, but in this case, not only was BJ put up for adoption, it's literally passing on your traits to your child also did not see BJ being the killer even though looking back on it I think it was pretty obvious it was her with her waking up with blood probably wasn't paying attention whenever I watched this episode BJ is becoming like her father and they're able to compel her to stop and is sent to a psychic ward self-isolation could do the trick also drive her even more crazy there's an invisible assassin assassinating U.S. Army generals and it just seems like someone going after people in power but it looks like the U.S. government is trying to cover up the existence of American POWs still being kept in Vietnam. Tiger is the assassin and wants to kill the higher ups that are trying to keep hush about the entire situation. Tiger is also going to the loved ones of other soldiers to say that they're still alive giving them hope that one day they'll see their loved ones. It would look very bad if the government knew about POWs and just did nothing about it. Tiger feels like the boogeyman. They don't know when he'll pop up and and then just disappears when looking back. He's shot by one of the agents and dies and what does the government say? Tiger was a totally different person and Mother already says that it's a lie. Can't do anything about it. If he keeps asking about what happened then they might silence him and all they're gonna do is keep the truth from ever coming out. Number 40, Home from Season 4, Episode 2. This was the episode that was, I think, banned? Apparently, the subject of incest was too taboo and sensitive. The Peacock family lives kind of off-grid. They're in their own house with no electricity or anything. They are stuck in the past. One of the many things that they love doing is procreate in-house. Each of the family members have defects, and because they're off-grid, operate on their own terms, like breaking into the sheriff's house and killing him and his wife, and are able to get away with it. The mother, Mrs. Peacock, seems to be held captive, but seems to enjoy her time with her eldest son and so she's okay with starting a family with him. Aside from the incest part, the Peacock family wasn't able to move on and was stuck in their ways. Eventually time catches up to them. They're still living like they're in the 17 or 1800s or something like that. So because they killed the sheriff, Mulder and Scully go off to kill them. The only ones that escaped were the mom and the eldest son and they plan on starting a new family which I'm gonna assume will not go well. The Smoky Man goes to Scully about wanting to travel with them and claims to want to get the cure of mankind's disease. This is already weird because usually he goes to Mulder about just pretty much anything. Conspiracies, a cure, his family. So when he goes to Scully, I'm already like, what does he want from her? Anytime Scully has a chance to record and get something from him, she's leaving evidence for Mulder to find. He's dying because of the goddamn smoking he's been doing and is at a point in his life where he feels lonely. Killed his son, sent his wife for experiments. He has no one to go to, which is why he goes to Scully to feel some sort of comfort. He's not a one-dimensional character that just seems bad. Now that is not the only thing that he wants from her. Scully feels that she was drugged and claims to have done no such thing. Later on, he said that he impregnated her and used her to get a disc. Meanwhile, this entire time, Mulder has been looking for her and when she shows back up, he looks pretty pissed off because he was lied to by her and she got the fake disc. So despite taking every precaution possible, the smoky man still got what he wanted. 
Donnie comes back and of course continues his obsession over Scully. He was broken out by this guy named Orson. He's kind of like a cult leader but without a cult, he thinks he can change or persuade Donnie to possibly change his ways or something along the lines of that. But Orson realizes that Donnie is pure evil and literally turns into a demon and kills him. Donnie was seen as a demon in the first episode as a way to show a cool visual on how evil he is. Scully isn't too happy about his escape and is dreading having to deal with him again. It seems like history is repeating itself. Donnie finds and captures Scully. He gets everything already and again Mulder shows up and stops it. But instead of letting him go back to prison, Scully takes her gun and shoots Donnie, killing him. She questioned whether or not she was in control when she shot him but I think she didn't want to have to deal with him over and over again. Sending him to prison didn't work so in order to get rid of evil, you have to permanently get rid of him or else evil just keeps on coming back. Dreamland is where a Freaky Friday occurs. Mulder and Morris switch bodies and have their own fun adventures with their new lives. Mulder has a job at Area 51, has a family who seems to not like him because he's distant with them. Mulder dances for a bit because why not? Doesn't remember his kids' names. On the other hand, Morris works at the FBI, seems concerned for the FBI, slaps Scully's ass. He lives alone, isn't bothered by his family. Mulder got the short end of the stick of the switch. Should Scully have noticed that Mulder was acting weird the entire time? Yeah, sure, she should have said something. I mean, she did, but then never really question that it's not really Mulder inside of you know Mulder and since Morris's family already doesn't really like him Mulder's saying the things that he said just fits with what Morris would have said and the reason why I put this episode higher than the second part was the redemption for Morris this episode was good at just portraying him as a piece of shit Mulder is stuck in 1939 because he went looking for the Bermuda Triangle. He's at the time during the outbreak of World War II. He meets some familiar faces like Skinner, Spender, and the Smoky Man are all Nazi officers. Scully is hanging out and dancing. The entire feel of the episode is just great. You can tell everyone was having a lot of fun and got to do something different. And a lot of care was put into this episode. The editing was also really damn good. When both goalies walk towards each other, but at a different time, they noticed that something might have been walked across each other. Which also means that they're both happening at the same time time and then there's that scully one shot where she can't seem to catch a break she wants to find out what happened to Mulder, goes to spend her but then finds out you can't really trust him skinner gets to her and helps out but then has to yell at her to remain neutral to spenders and the others 1930s scully has to turn the ship around to get back to the triangle so that Mulder can get back in the present and once he's back no one's gonna believe that he was in 1939 and talking to different versions of other characters i don't care about baseball but the unnatural made me care about it because of an alien played by jesse l martin he plays josh who is an alien all he wants to do is play baseball. He doesn't care about the other aliens, the bounty hunters, or the syndicate. He found what he enjoyed and wants to do it for the rest of his life. Josh befriends Arthur, who was part of the X-Files, and after revealing himself as an alien to him, he doesn't rat him out. Both enjoy being on the road, and all that matters is that he's happy. That happiness can't last forever. The bounty hunter is sent to kill him because it would ruin everything and leak info about the existence of aliens. The hunter kills him and is supposed to bleed green, even in human form, but bleeds red. Josh wanted to feel so much like a human eventually became true, it almost seems unnatural for this to happen. Doggett deals with a religious cult leader who kills his victims in their sleep and obviously this reminds me of Freddy Krueger and Nightmare on Elm Street. Killing people in their sleep is a great concept because you need sleep at some point which means you can't escape the inevitable attack or visions from this guy. Scully's on maternal leave which means this is another chance to test Doggett's skepticism. At first he thinks his visions are just bad dreams but then when the lone gunmen meet him at the office they all come to the same conclusion that this leader can get inside of people's dreams and then kill them. Kind of opening up to the idea that that's even a possibility and later admits to Skinner that he feels scared even though he's in a coma. He feels that somehow he'll be able to get inside his dreams despite the fact that he shouldn't even be able to. Skinner tells him don't worry about it but his fears come true when he's asleep and has a dream where he's gonna kill Scully in her sleep. Dog is able to fight this and axe himself waking back up and sees Scully standing over him and informs that the cult leader is truly dead. The fear and eerie atmosphere of the episode really works because Dog is in a very vulnerable state. Scully has cancer and tells Mulder and Skinner about it and still plans on working because she wants to avoid it for as long as possible until it gets really bad but she can't avoid it for too long because Mulder suspects that her abduction caused her cancer and meet Penny Northern who was also abducted and also has cancer. Penny can be Scully's future and it sort of reminds and causes her to fight back against the disease by any means necessary rather than constantly avoiding the inevitable. Mulder breaks into a research facility to find a possible cure for Scully but then finds clones that intend to protect the abducted woman because it's their mothers. Skinner attempts to help by contacting 
contacting the smoky man which goes the way that you would expect it they can't come to an agreement and then agree to come to terms with a deal in private which means one of them mailing skinner is probably going to be screwed over it's just nice to know that scully has two people that will be there for her when things get really bad x dying in his season 4 premiere was kind of surprising because he's been Mulder's informant for like three seasons and now what is he gonna have to find another informant that's with the syndicate and then later on get killed again i guess marita was close to that the syndicate finds out about x's meetings with Mulder and leads him to a trap and is shot by the gray-haired man meanwhile the bounty hunter is still chasing after Mulder and jeremiah they both come across samantha who is a clone and lives with a bunch of other clones sort of baiting Mulder into thinking that his sister was still alive and still at the age that she was when she was missing at this point i didn't believe that Mulder was ever gonna find her because it took so long to get to it and no matter what they threw at the bounty hunter he cannot be destroyed and apparently he can not only destroy and kill anything in his way but he can also heal as well because he was asked by the smoking man to heal Mulder's mom as having someone with nothing to lose can be much more dangerous Skinner is being accused of murder when he hooks up in a one-night stand and the lady is found dead. This is the first Skinner-centric episode. He never talks about anything else other than work, like he was married and then got a divorce because of the same reason. Doesn't really open up, keeps everything to himself and doesn't know how to open up and is emotionally distant even to his ex-wife, which plays into him being really suspicious because he is nowhere to be seen when they need him. Mulder and Scully search to see if anyone else was involved and they find that an assassin may be the main killer, but in the end, it doesn't help Skinner's case because he knew where to find the assassin which indicates that he might have known the assassin the identity of the guy is unknown so while skinner gets his job back and somewhat clears his name it is still a mystery as to what skinner knew and who the assassin was number 30 redux 2 from season 5 episode 2 betrayal is the center point of this episode the smoking man is betrayed by the syndicate this has been a long time coming one of them tried killing him earlier and it didn't work out like with the previous members they've grown tired of his disappointment and recklessness when it comes to getting rid of Mulder and not putting the syndicate first instead he lets things loose like Carjack was supposed to be killed but then lied straight to their faces or trying to recruit Mulder into the syndicate which why would he even think it was a good idea but no body was found so he's still alive somewhere out there and then there's a traitor within the FBI and Mulder admits later on that he guessed that it was one of the guys on the panel whose name I don't remember it doesn't matter because he gets killed getting caught even if Mulder guessed he's now outed and Skull's cancer goes into remission which was to be expected she wasn't gonna get killed off the Nazis may have been involved in having contact with aliens which doesn't come as a surprise but also might have helped created the human alien hybrids the reason for even creating it is to fight back against the possible invasion of aliens Mulder sees an alien ship which is always cool but never able to show anyone evidence I do wonder if the show aired when smartphones were a thing how things would have been different if he did record then there would be an argument that it's fake so it would just be an ongoing argument if it's real or not Krajak was supposed to die but didn't and will be a pain in the ass to the smoky man Skinner Mulder and Scully because he only cares about him himself playing both sides and we get to see Skinner have the one and only time where he has an upper hand on the smoky man about the tape and he's so frustrated with Skinner that he yells at him and it's great seeing Skinner not be under the wing of him the tape is supposed to have evidence of human alien hybrid experiments and even when he calls Skinner's bluff on not having it anymore Skinner has a Navajo native that memorized the tape and threatens to reveal its secrets if Mulder and Scully are hurt there's a person named Leonard Betts who works as an EMT and depends on cancer to live and regenerate his limbs if he ever gets gets hurt this already makes for an interesting episode seeing someone who needs it to survive is the polar opposite of what you should do with it it seems that like he could help and cure people with cancer if he's dependent on it but instead wants to live more than helping others Leonard also has the ability to detect if a person has cancer and he seems to suggest that Scully has it and in the end would have it and be the start of her storyline with cancer Mulder gets a new partner, Alex Krajak, who seems like a good enough partner for him, takes his job seriously enough, where he gets his work done by any means necessary, doesn't seem too keen on Mulder's theories on aliens and anything paranormal, but of course, what is the one constant of this show? It's the Smoky Man and Krajak reports to him about Mulder and the X-Files being disbanded, has only made Mulder and Scully more determined. Tony Todd plays one of the people that were experimented on for sleep deprivation, which caused him to have the ability to make illusions in people's minds, sleeping while it's great is also very annoying because there's so much that I want to do but so little time the older you get and sleep just kind of gets in the way and you know what I kind of envy Tony Todd for not sleeping in what seems like years would have gone probably crazy because you need sleep but just the extra time would be so nice he's going around killing anyone that was involved in lobotomizing them but of course Krajak kills him and gives the excuse that he thought he was holding a gun to keep him shut about the experiments and leave no evidence behind 
Dwayne Bear comes back even though he was hospitalized and apprehended the episode before, he needs someone to go with him that he doesn't sound insane saying that he was abducted, so he kidnaps Scully and forces her to go with him. Mulder and Krajak go to find her and bury it while on the side, Krajak contacts the swung on Kelly Mulder in case he finds out the truth but insists on letting him live because it would be too easy just to get rid of Mulder like that and Krajak slips up because Mulder finds cigarettes in his car and once Mulder realizes this, Krajak is never seen again for a while. I thought this would be dragged out because it would be fun seeing how much Krajak would do to keep his secret from Mulder but this one episode did that and I guess it's enough and then when Bear takes Scully to the field, she gets abducted and he sees that as a win but in the end gets killed by Krajak for attempting to reveal the truth which leaves Mulder alone for a few episodes and the X files reopened with Mulder going solo. A random box shows up in a prison and spreads a disease to a bunch of inmates and when two other inmates that have escaped prison also come in contact with the box, it means that they're probably gonna spread the disease if they keep moving from place to place. This disease looks like a giant but deadlier pimple. Skull is busy researching what the source of the disease is. While Mulder attempts to stop the prisoners from spreading it, Mulder wants to make this known but the smoke man says it would cause mass panic which is true. Let's just say if there was a pandemic, people would have likely freaked out, jumped to conclusions because they're scared and have no idea what's going on, bought a lot of water and toilet paper. Later on, it turns out the box was an experiment to see what would happen to the prisoners, willing to just use lives for further research and possibly the entire world, and discredit Mulder and Scully's investigation because the package could be explained as a postal mistake. Mulder's past comes back to haunt him. Years ago, he was working on a case and made the mistake of not shooting John Barnett, who shot one of the agents who had a family. Mulder could have prevented this and regrets not shooting him. And to make him even feel more guilty, Barnett feels no remorse at all. He taunts Mulder during the court. So Barnett comes back much younger than he was. And that's because Dr. Ridley researched on reversing age and was revoked of his medical license when he tried it on children. He successfully combined salamander cells with Barnett. And one of his arms is a salamander, which looks messy messed up and kind of disgusting. And then when Mulder comes face to face with Barnett again in a very similar situation, he doesn't make the mistake of letting Barnett pull the trigger and shoots him. He's not gonna let him win again. Barnett dies with Ridley's research. One son gets rid of the syndicate. The smoking man is talking to an unknown person about his history with family, talks about how hard it was to sacrifice Cassandra to experiments. And when it comes to getting rid of her because she's gonna tell the truth, he is unable to do it. There's some humanity left in him and still cares about somebody that he loves. But what he can do is kill Spender because I guess he was being defiant and can be easily replaced. The Smoky Man has always been the most interesting and complex character. There's always layers to him even though on the outside seems like a cold and evil person. The person he's telling the story to is Diana who at first I'm not gonna lie I was like who? And then remembered she was an ex of Mulder's and worked in the X-Files for a bit when Mulder and Scully weren't allowed to work in it anymore. Both he and Diana knew the rebel was gonna show up and allow the syndicate and all of their families to be killed probably as revenge since they wanted him dead so why not just kill the entire group with everyone that they also love. Spender admits everything to Kirsch about being against Mulder and Scully and reopens the X-Files to them once again before getting shot by his father for switching sides and from his perspective throwing away his mother like she was nothing. An old ass dude named Alfred seems to know when exactly to take a photo of a crime and may be responsible for them because he's stalking this lady in the cold opening just to see her die and then take the photo. Scully goes on this case with another partner because she's allowed to prove her worth to the FBI but Mulder isn't because he's crazy but the scenes with his phone calls were great. He's bored and wants in on this case by any means necessary. After Scully talks to Alfred for a bit, she learns that he wants to die by meeting death itself. He was stabbed earlier and just got up and healed. He can't die for whatever reason, which is why he goes to people that he knows will die because he sees them in black and white. He wants to know why he has lived for so long because he hates it. Everyone he knows and cares about is dead. He's 149 years old. Being immortal doesn't sound too bad because who wants to die? But the more you think about it, you realize what else is there for you. Your family is dead and if you decide to start your own family then they're also dead you'll die of boredom eventually and then while they're talking he sees scully turn black and white and with scully being a skeptic she refuses to believe that she's gonna die her other partner shows up and shoots off her through scully and when both lay down he asks if she sees death covers her hands with his and color returns to scully while alfred dies of a gunshot wound i'm assuming that scully really saw death and that alfred covered her hand which meant that it transferred to him and that he finally got to see death and then die i think that's what happened but either way it's a really good episode
Drive has Mulder constantly on the move because if he stops, then Walter White will have a chunk of his head explode. The cold opening was a great way to open up how deranged Walter White or Patrick would be later on with his wife in pain, so she gave him birth notes, not that. And then when they take her into the police car, her head explodes live on TV, which will mess up anyone who saw it. Imagine you're watching the news for some reason and then see an actual person's head explode out of nowhere. It leads to Patrick and Mulder in a car, driving for what seems like forever. Patrick explains that they must keep driving or else he dies like his wife did. Everyone else thinks Patrick seems insane and Scully takes herself and a hazmat team to look around Patrick's home and see a dog is also suffering but an elderly lady who is deaf is fine. There's low frequency waves under the property coming from US Navy antenna which caused pressure in the air. Patrick suspects that the government put it there as a bigger conspiracy that's going on but I think something just went wrong with the antenna. Patrick is a ticking time bomb and Mulder Drogo's not getting shot by him while driving or else Patrick will die and Scully and the others have to come up with some solution so you're on the edge of your seat only for Patrick to die while saving everyone they come across would be nice it's just not possible number 20 conduit from season 1 episode 4 this was the episode that convinced me to not only keep watching the show but eventually do this ranking video whenever i pick a show to rank every episode that i've never seen i don't know if i'm gonna like it or not if i don't then i just scrap the entire video and either just watch it casually or just stop watching this episode showed that it was gonna be much more than finding aliens and getting into ridiculous fun Mulder has something he wanted to prove that he wants to be real and get closure on his sister which is why he's so determined to solve cases about a girl getting abducted. He gets emotionally attached to it. They eventually find the girl and say she's okay and can't say anything about what happened to her. Mulder at the end sits in a church and cries while he looks at a picture of Samantha, still thinks about that night and how he did nothing and misses her. He's able to save others and get this girl back to her family but knows that he couldn't save Samantha which is why he still believes that she's still out there and alive. It's a great way to immediately like Mulder and get behind him even if my first initial thought was that Samantha might already be dead already and Mulder is just wishing thinking but that's the entire point of Mulder believing in the impossibilities Skinner is acting suspicious again, but for a good reason. He's covering up deaths by deleting all the files on a person that was killed by a swarm of bees. Skinner is doing this because the Smoky Man claims to help Scully's cancer if he erases any evidence of the bees while impersonating as Mulder. I did not for one second think that he was going to do anything for her, and he doesn't at all in the end. The Smoky Man does what he does best and uses Skinner to do some work for him and gives him the hope that he might help out Scully when he has no intention of doing anything. Mulder finds out what Skinner has been up to and convinces him he's still on their side and is doing it for Scully. The bees were a result of the syndicate once again using humans as experiments because they have no issue sacrificing a good amount of people for a new project or a thing that they have. So in the end, the Smoky Man is the only person that gets what he wants. Skinner played himself for even agreeing to a deal with them. It might as well be the same as making a deal with the devil and then Mulder also has nothing to help with Scully's cancer. Eve refers to the multiple clones of the same girl. Mulder and Scully come across two murders that seem alike. Both fathers die of something mysterious and both daughters look almost identical. Both find out that Eve was in prison and tested for a program on having extra chromosomes which also gives them superhuman intelligence and strength because why not? There's already a bunch of them. The thing that really did shock me was the two Eves killing their fathers. I thought there's something supernatural and maybe the Eves were related but got separated by birth but nope it's these two little girls that seem innocent and use it to their advantage to do whatever they want. These two were killing and since they seem a lot smarter than the older one they killed the older Eve that got them out to help and unify all the others because they have other plans and no one's gonna believe that they kill these people. Both go to Mulder and Scully and what should be an easy job for them, take care of the girls and buy them food and drinks until one of them puts poison in Mulder and Scully's sodas. Mulder finds the powder and both try to find them. Mulder and Scully pull a fake out to get them. Both go to the same hospital that the other Eve was also in which sets up a possible comeback as a person in a lab coat comes in to take them back but this was never followed up on which happens a lot. The season 2 finale ties back to Scully's abduction, Dwayne Barry, the smallpox, and even Mulder's dad. It's revealed that he knew the Smoky Man and probably worked together and this entire time he said nothing about aliens, Samantha, or the syndicate. After Bill's reunion with the Smoky Man, he tends to tell Mulder everything but before he can, Cryjack comes in and kills him which sets Mulder over the edge. This entire episode he was already on edge because of the tape not being readable and needing some decryption and is tired of the FBI that he punches Skinner and since Mulder was the only one there when his dad died that means he's prime suspect. After fighting Krajak and Scully shoots Mulder, she takes him to New Mexico to patch him up and explain that the water in his building had a drug in it which caused his behavior and killing Krajak would have proven that Mulder killed his own father. Scully finds information on her and Barry on the tape meaning that their abductions were something much more bigger than a random abduction and experiments. The Navajos are the ones that find the dead creatures with the smallpox scars. Mulder goes to check and that's when the Smoky Man comes in with the helicopter to destroy the bodies and Mulder in an explosion who's totally dead. It's a great 
great finale because it shows how much influence the smoking man has on what seems like everyone including bill Mulder, who seemed like a background character only to find out he might have been involved in samantha's disappearance but once again when Mulder's about to learn the truth it is taken away from him and then the tapes being tied back to scully's abduction and barry leads to even more questions on what the hell did they do to her and what's their plan with her and other abductees Dwayne barry is an alien abductee who wants everyone to believe him so badly that he holds a hostage situation to prove his point which isn't the best idea because the people that already see him as insane will not change their minds after this whole ordeal and what's great is that Mulder is sent there to talk to him because according to the FBI he's the only one that can understand him so while Mulder wants to believe in Barry's story he also has to get a bunch of people to safety and not get shot himself Barry's at the point where he's willing to hurt others if no one believes him Mulder is in a way sort of looking at himself because of the things that he said comes across as someone who makes up lies and theories about aliens Golly finds that Barry's frontal cortex was damaged because he was shot in the head back in 1982 and thinks that he's a pathological liar but when they stop him find metal implants in his body no one was checking up on Barry so he just gets back up and kidnaps Scully to make sure that his point is proven Colony Endgame introduces the bounty hunter who is the most intimidating thing in the show. Mulder gets to reunite with his sister and they're catching up on what happened in the past like several decades. However, it is too good to be true because Samantha isn't really Samantha. She's a clone and there are others as well. They were a part of this alien human hybrid project. Mulder gets to be happy just for a bit and then gets taken away with disappointment. The bounty hunter is here to get rid of all of them as they are considered evidence and can just slip up the truth of what happened to them. It has green toxic blood and if it gets on you then it spreads and looks like acid. The only way to kill them is to pierce the base of the neck. All of their efforts would be meaningless because the hunter gets to all the clones, contacts X about his whereabouts, and leads them to a submarine which is a really cool looking set. He meets the bounty hunter and of course gets his ass kicked. There is no way Mulder defeats a killing machine. He's at a point where he isn't afraid to die anymore. He was going to get an answer for him no matter what he said, which he says that she's still alive. It wasn't the answer that he was looking for, but gave him faith to keep on looking. There's a guy named Jeremiah Smith who has the ability to kill people which gets the intention of Mulder, Scully, and the Syndicate. Mulder and Scully want to see him for some possible information on Mulder's family and the Syndicate and then the Smoking Man sends the bounty hunter after him because he's revealing to the public what's possible with a little experiment being done to you. Jeremiah has lost faith in the Syndicate's project. He's causing mass panic to the public even though it's relatively positive. They still want to get rid of him and then when the Smoking Man goes to talk to him, he shapeshifts to Deep Throat and Bill Mulder to get under his skin and see what he's done in order to keep the truth hidden maybe keeping the truth entirely is a mistake because while it will likely create mass freakouts and panic Mulder and his mom deserve to know where samantha is the smoking man also seems to know Mulder's mom as x was capturing their argument about whatever they're arguing about it could have been about Mulder, bill aliens or maybe she also knew about what happened to samantha but she suffers a stroke so despite having members lose faith in the project the smoking man doesn't seem to budge and will continue to keep the truth hidden Cassandra Spender just pops up after disappearing for a long time and spills the beans on what happened. Spender has been looking for her and the first thing that he doesn't want to hear is her wanting to see Mulder. Spender doesn't like him very much and doesn't believe in the alien stuff. Cassandra is a result of the first successful alien-human hybrid test and the smoking man allowed it to happen in order to prepare for the alien invasion. Spender has demanded to know the truth but his father just keeps on yelling and refuses to tell them. It's not until he hears it from Krajak and you start to see Spender's denial and realization that his father is a monster no matter if it was for the alien invasion you just don't send your wife to be experimented on for a greater cause the smoking man has no one else to go to his son is going to betray him for taking away his mother cassandra obviously hates him for turning her into a hybrid and the syndicate wanted him dead so the only person he goes to is diana who agrees to help him out which later on will be a fatal mistake on her part and on top of all of this the rebels are attacking while things look bad for him in the end he will come on top because he always seems to be ahead of everyone Bad Blood is another episode where Mulder and Scully tell their versions of the story and the truth most likely lies between the middle of their stories. Versions have their moments like Luke Wilson and Mulder's version. Scully has a crush on him and has buck teeth and doesn't understand how anyone can be attracted to him. While in Scully's version, oh man he is great and seems to be interested in Scully. Both stories see each other as annoying and end in similar ways. Both chase after the pizza boy Ronnie but Mulder stakes Ronnie's heart because he thinks he's a vampire in Scully's version while in Mulder's version, Bullet seems to have no effect on him and Mulder chases after Ronnie after recovering from being drugged and then when Ronnie is being checked he wakes up which means Mulder and Scully have to go back to investigate. Luke Wilson mentions that Ronnie makes them look bad so he's a vampire with green eyes. He already drugged Scully while Mulder gets overwhelmed by people with glowing green eyes. Both wake up unharmed and see no more of them around. Whenever they have to give the report to Skinner he's amazed by the lack of unity from both. Why were there vampires there and what was their goal? And to be honest I don't care because at the end of the day it was a really fun episode. 
Number 10, Monday from Season 6, Episode 14. A time loop episode was bound to pop up, and like with most of them, this one is great. Mother and Scully go through the same day with some differences every now and then, but both don't realize that they're in a time loop. A woman named Pam is the one who remembers and has to relive the same day over and over again. She knows her boyfriend Bernard plans on robbing a bank, and if the plan doesn't go well, then he has a bomb to explode the place, which restarts the day. Pam tries talking both to Mother and Scully at different points, but it seems to have the same results. She even tries talking to Skinner. With most time loops, they're usually fun and there's a bit of it in this episode with Mulder's waterbed and falling down. This time loop is about Pan's suffering. She has to relive a nightmare and even when she tries to help, it seems helpless. She has gone through every possibility that she's thought of except one. There's always the one thing that changes the events dramatically. Since Pam constantly reminds Mulder of what happens, Mulder starts to remember Pam and the bomb and calls Scully, goes up to her boyfriend and hands him the gun and asks him to walk away but that didn't change anything as he still grabs the gun but Pam walks in and it seems like events are bound to repeat again but Pam throws herself in front of Mulder and dies. This was the one thing that she did not think of doing. Had to be the ultimate sacrifice in order to break the time loop. Number 9, X-Cops from Season 7, Episode 12. I was not expecting a crossover between the X-Files and Cops. I guess this makes Cops canon to the X-Files. The camera crew follows Mulder and Scully through this investigation of what seems like a creature, which also means that both will be on TV. Mulder embraces being on TV and has no issue being in the public eye, while Scully is much more uncomfortable appearing on TV, and anytime she has a chance to tell the camera crew to go away, she does it. I'm not a fan of Cops, but I definitely saw a couple of episodes when I was a kid. I'm my grandparents house. I remember the theme because who doesn't? And then the interviews with the neighbors or people around the crime scene. Obviously most of them in this episode were actors but I'm not sure if cops just had a real people interviewed and were okay with being on TV. I mean it seemed real when I was a kid but I'm not sure if cops were actually catching people at night. At first Mulder thinks that they're catching a werewolf but upon further investigation they're going after an entity that preys on the fears of people which is why there's scratch marks and even a name drop of Freddy Krueger. The camera almost catches the entity in a crack house but when dawn comes around, it disappears and spares a person's life. Mulder wanted something paranormal to be captured live on TV, but hope is not lost as it really comes down to the editors and how they put together the footage. This is a random crossover, but they somehow just make it work. Number 8, Beyond the Sea from Season 1, Episode 13. Brad Dorif is the main reason why this episode is great. The only thing I knew from him is obviously being the voice of Chucky and being in Rob Zombie's Halloween movies. He's a prisoner with psychic powers and his scenes where he's singing Beyond the Sea and seemingly knows how Scully's father may have passed away was great. He makes Scully question her skepticism because Beyond the Sea was playing when her father died but it could have been a coincidence. Scully continues to go back to him about the case and then opens up to the possibility that he may be a psychic and then I think this was the first episode where she wasn't doing the same thing. Mulder already had a bunch of development in episode 4 so at some point there needed to be one for Scully because what is she gonna do all season just tell Mulder that he's insane and then in the end doesn't see what Mulder sees and in the end she doesn't believe Brad Dorf because he could have looked up information about her father. The fact that she was willing to believe is better than being afraid to believe and based off the quick interaction that they had in the beginning, it seems that her father isn't too keen on having her a part of the FBI and says that if she were to believe that she could talk to him for one last time, she knows he would have said something about not working in the FBI and maybe as a way to atone for what he did, giving Scully one last chance to talk to her father was his way of saving her from the grief and regret she has about her father, doing something good before he gets executed. Number 7, Ice from Season 1 Episode 8. This episode is essentially John Carpenter Carpenter's The Thing, Mulder and Scully are stuck in a isolated cold area with other people and little do they know that there's a parasite running around and driving their host into fits of rage. One by one they start becoming paranoid and eventually violent because no one knows who's gonna start attacking. All throw their weapons away and go to sleep just to ease the tension but it would add on to the paranoia. Mulder looks suspicious for finding a dead body and so they lock him up in a freezer. There's even a dog that was infected and uses it as a test to see if there's any cure or if they can kill it before it gets outside of this area area and affects the rest of the world. The parasite is a worm and can be seen in the back of a neck which is where Hodge sees it on Sylvia's back and then they kill both worms by having one another go inside of Sylvia. The thing could have been 200,000 years old or even more. Mother wants to go back to the area for research but of course the government destroyed it because it would affect the world but there's still that slight possibility that someone created it and it got out of control so cover the evidence. This episode shows that the concept of the thing is not only amazing but works as a standalone episode and further cements Carpenter's The Thing as one of the most perfect movies. 
Number 6, Pusher from Season 3, Episode 17. Pusher was a great cat and mouse episode. He has the ability to bend people's will and has a game for Mulder to play. He knows that he's dying of a brain tumor, which is what gives him his abilities, so he wants to go out on a bang that will make anyone remember who he is and what he did. He has Mulder in a room with a revolver and forces him to play Russian roulette, taking a gamble on killing Mulder, Scully, or himself. Love that even when he eventually lost, he was never worried about getting caught or dying. He always knew what he wanted to do because he was dying and had his carefree attitude about the entire situation. Seeing Mulder fight back, Scully pleading for him to stop, and Pusher sitting back and watching was great. Mulder eventually turns it around and shoots Pusher, putting him in a coma. He didn't think once that anyone could take him out, and while Mulder did shoot him, he still got an entertaining game from him, and he could have had his tumor removed but kept it for his ego and made him feel big and invincible. Number 5, Just Switz from Season 7, Episode 21. Mother comes across a genie who grants three wishes to a person and I love that this genie has grown tired of being a genie because she's been around for a very long time and every time she grants someone three wishes, they always use it for greed and on themselves. Over time, she's grown to hate humanity after seeing the worst of the worst of it. The first guy wastes pretty much all of his wishes and it goes to Mother, so his first grant is peace on earth, which wipes out the entire population. You have to be very specific on what you wish for, which the genie doesn't mention at all. It also means that wanting something that benefits the world is an impossible wish. Wanting world peace is a pipe dream. As much as it sounds great, it's impossible. Mulder wanted to help everyone and better their lives, but you can't always help everyone. It's too much to ask even for a genie, and forcing people to his wish is also not the best way to achieve it. You have to let people decide what they want to do. So instead of a selfish wish, Mulder's last wish is to free the genie of being a genie, which is the best wish he could have granted. She was getting tired of listening to people's greedy needs and was free to do whatever she wanted. She isn't forced to listen and grant any more wishes, nor is Mulder forcing a wish onto the world as well. Number 4, How the Ghost Stole Christmas from Season 6, Episode 6. On Christmas Eve, Mulder has the bright idea of going to a known haunted house and brings Scully along even though he knows she's not interested in wasting time going to a abandoned building, but goes anyway. Once they're inside, the spooky fun begins. They seem to be stuck in the same room until they're not. Both are separated and meet old people who are a couple. These two tell them sort of the truth about Mulder and Scully's relationship. Mulder is lonely, not only during Christmas, but pretty much all the time and doesn't want to be anymore. While Scully already has had plans for Christmas, she still went with Mulder so that she can prove him wrong. And then the couple just assumed Mulder and Scully were a couple, which at this point in the show, they might as well be a couple. This episode feels like a haunted house maze where Mulder and Scully have to escape from it but also maybe confront the reason why they're even there. And it made me think of a Tim Burton movie with the big house, lightning, and gothic look to it. The couple also assumes that Mulder and Scully were here for a suicide pact because that's what they did. In order to be with each other forever, they committed suicide and stayed as ghosts so they convinced both to kill each other and both shoot at the end only for Mulder to break the illusion and get out of there. While it was all in their heads, I still think the part of Mulder about being lonely and Scully wanting to prove him wrong were true. They were forced to listen to what they really wanted on Christmas. In the end, Mulder isn't alone. Scully shows up at his place. Both exchange gifts to each other so that they're happy. Number 3, Christmas Carol from Season 5, Episode 6. Scully has some regrets about her decisions in life. During a Christmas break, instead of spending time with her family, she gets phone calls and leads her to a little girl who might be her sister Skit. There are flashbacks that show Scully's childhood and how she grew up and why she is the way that she is. She had this rabbit and hid it from her brother and then when she came back to it, the rabbit suffocated and died. It parallels back to the present where Scully wants to have kids because having kids wasn't her main priority but after having cancer and having sort of any connections to a person seems useless, caused her to be afraid of death and now she wants kids. Sometimes life changes you and now maybe you want things that might have been useless back when you were younger. You think you know what you want but it's not until something happens to you that is when you prioritize what you really want out of life but because of her abduction she can no longer have kids so she wants to adopt Emily but then the person from the adoption agency is hesitant because of Scully's job and Emily is a special needs kid there always seems to be a roadblock when she's seeking to get a child but then something amazing happens when the results come in and show that Emily's mother is Scully Number 2, Elegy from Season 4, Episode 22. Scully's skepticism is once again tested as she and Mulder track down a series of murders that lead to a mentally ill home. Scully sees the spirit of one of the victims and doesn't say anything to Mulder as she's afraid to admit that spirits exist. She can only hold off from telling him the truth because no matter how much she tries to brush it off or try to use science to explain what she saw, it eventually will come out and later on she tells him about it and is kind of pissed off because she's hiding the truth and finding the truth is what Mulder kind of does. Stresses that there needs to be trust 
honest with each other. There's no need to hide the truth from each other as it helps with the case and with both of their fears. Scully's afraid to believe while Mother fears him believing can lead to nothing. And then Nurse Anne's is just evil because she wants to ruin Harold's happiness, murdering the people that he had an affection towards. Her husband left her for a younger woman and so she just spread that hate and projected it on Harold and the victims because she's really miserable with their life. So why not spread it to others so that they can feel miserable as well? Even after getting rid of her, he dies not because of an injury. He died due to Anne's taking every ounce of happiness away. And then number one, what I think is the best episode, Musings of a Cigarette Smoky Man from Season 4, Episode 7. Before this episode, the Smoky Man seemed like a menacing person intent on hiding the truth from the public by any means necessary and has no empathy for anyone at all. But that is far from the truth. The Smoky Man was obviously once young and didn't smoke. Over time, he started to smoke because he became addicted to it and liked the habit of doing it and maybe looking kind of cool when he walked into room. But I don't think he cares if he has cancer or starts dying from it because he's become addicted to it. He gets called into a room with men in black suits and the general. According to the general, his father was a great man and expects him to inherit his traits. They select him to be behind the important events like the assassination of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. Years later, he meets Deep Throat and both think about how they've changed and saved the course of history with no public knowledge. And then on the side, he likes to write novels and would like to hope that it will get serialized in a magazine. He seems to really care about this novel and when it eventually does, he's excited to get it to a magazine only to be disappointed to find that his ending was changed. All he wanted to do was have his work be recognized because he can't have assassinations and aliens be public. He needs another outlet to have his work feel like it's being recognized and even that he feels disappointing. It shows that he's a human being like Mulder, Scully, and everyone else on the show. He's not just an evil guy with no sort of reason behind it or doesn't seem to have empathy. He's doing things from the shadows to help the world and wants to write a novel. He wants to create something that he won't destroy but despite his efforts, it always seems that he destroys everything that he comes across and it makes him an interesting and complex character ranking every season to my least favorite to my favorite season nine which isn't a bad season no season of this show is straight up bad it's more frustrating sort of baiting and decisions and just doing really redundant things season nine has Mulder and Scully come back which just leave them be Mulder's in court in the two part finale because he killed someone important and then the truth is never out which I like as a I guess first ending to the entire show but the rest of the finale was just whatever Reyes gets no ending she just kind of drives off with Doggett Doggett gets his closure with his son which was really nice and of course the season was saved by some really cool one-off episodes the 4d episode with different worlds the one with the lord of the flies the brady bunch episodes also really good pretty much checked out for the main story there's still some really cool and good one-off episodes Season 10 is really short, though it manages to be just okay. The alien hoax thing was really annoying. Not annoying, but just like, no, do not do this. And luckily they didn't. Einstein and Miller were copies of Mulder and Scully, which was not a good idea at all. They just felt really on the nose and just kind of like, okay, whatever. Reyes working for the Swoggy Man, sure. I guess there needs to be some familiar face with him. Also, he's not dead. Shocker. The pandemic end, which pretty much predicted the pandemic two years later, or I guess, yeah, two or three years later. One and standout up episode was the wear monster episode because it's pretty much life sucks season 8 was the first season where i noticed the quality dip just overall there's still some good episodes like the dream killer the subway with paranoia the Mulder and dog get buddy cop episode was really cool Mulder going away did sort of like deflate the show but don't bait people into like thinking he's coming back which he did it seemed like every four to five episodes it was like hey here's Mulder, and it's like okay we know he's like gone or at least i did i didn't realize he was gonna come back like really come back super soldiers are still a threat and cool and then crajack finally dies this goddamn cockroach the smoking man couldn't kill him syndicate couldn't kill him Mulder couldn't kill him it was Skinner who did it which makes sense he's been using nanotech as a leverage against Skinner and so Skinner's like you know what screw you and just shoots him he's always on his own side and the season had a good end Mulder couldn't find the truth but he got Scully and a kid good just end it there Season 11, this is the second end of the entire series. And once again, I thought it was okay. Just kind of felt nothing by the end because of the redundancy and just sort of Scully and Mulder spinning their wheels. It really should have been just them work together for one last time. No Smokey Man, no William, no like, just, you know, none of that. Just have them work together, have fun, banter. That's really what I want. But instead, there has to be this Skinner trust issue, which there shouldn't even be a trust issue. William's back, sure. Smokey Man dies again like all right i feel nothing about this i'm getting real checked out here at least the ai episode was good just no dialogue and Mulder and scully just doing stuff as a story 
Season 7 was a good season. Mulder and Scully trying to prevent the alien invasion. Mulder having to be taken as sort of an end for him but also a way to have him come back was really cool because he always wanted to find the truth and so he went to the truth which means he disappears and he is unsolved X-Files case which would have been a really cool ending. Cartrack kills a smoky man which yeah okay. Samantha and what happened to her might be a bit underwhelming for people that follow the show but as someone who just binge watched it I was sort of like okay come on finally you know we're getting answers. It took seven goddamn seasons and then Scully being pregnant felt super last minute. Season 1 was a good start for the entire show. It establishes Mulder and Scully and who they are and what they believe in. Right off from the gate, there are breadcrumbs of deep throat and story scattered throughout the season because the show is in its first season. They're trying to figure out what to do and find its footing. Should be an issue, but it's not. Because of the nature of the show of unsolved X-Files cases, Deep Throat comes in, gives this ominous mystery like what if or like aliens are truly out there for a very long time or whatever. It just works. And the show also proved that it could be much more than aliens. It can have the Thing episode, immune that can squeeze through holes, having multiple clones, and even a guy that can create fire out of his hands. Season 3 shows up more of the syndicate and how they work behind the scenes and immediately you can tell that some of them have disagreements but this would over time just create sort of tension and just cause them to try to kill each other and then eventually the one who gets away with it is a smoking man and kind of leads them to death by the rebels. The black oil would be a interesting and thing to try to defeat because how do you defeat this black oil? Cryjack gets infected with it, spits it out and gets captured. Scully's sister dies and it feels like the first half and then a little bit of the second half is her dealing with that which I didn't find too interesting as the viewer we already know that who killed her and that it was just a mistake and then hybrids alien human hybrids would be tested on and then her successful one to come out is in season six Season 5, Scully's cancer is immediately taken care of because there's no way she's gonna die. Mulder losing his faith in believing in the season was not particularly fond of because still is the polar opposite from Scully. Most of the cases is him being sort of a skeptic, which I didn't find too entertaining. It was just to, you know, change the pace of the show instead of having Mulder and Scully do the same thing, but I just prefer having Mulder be the one making up theories and wanting to believe in werewolves, vampires, ghosts, aliens. Spender is also introduced, I think, in this season well i guess technically in four a younger version of the spooky man so then they just had the actor came back as his own son he would be a roadblock for Mulder and scully but also his own father later on the syndicate is trying to combat the black oil by creating a black oil vaccine and then gibson this child prodigy can tell people's thoughts it's an issue because he would reveal the truth and secrets of aliens ghosts and everything that the syndicate will be working for would all just crumble if this boy just starts to mouth and off the first half of season 2 immediately started off with a change of pace because the X-Files was no more which meant that Mulder and Scully had to do things on their own. Scully was abducted which means that she was gone for at least 2 episodes. The first half is change but also a really good change of pace. X would be Mulder's informant and I thought he would be you know recurring character and not get killed off but he did. Crashjack is introduced as his nice partner to Mulder but the truth is that he's working for the Smoky Man but that would also be a mistake because it's a Smoky Man and he always kills you. Bounty Hunter which is still the one biggest and most frightening thing and threat on the show he is so big and imposing and nothing can kill it aside from like that syringe on the back of his neck season four they kill off x right at the beginning there's not going to be any more informants i guess aside from marita the black oil comes back and Mulder once again has a team up with cryjack Mulder supposedly destroys the black oil probably now has cancer and this would start her starline of having nosebleeds and having Mulder and skinner worry about her still wants to work because she wants to avoid this cancer thing until it gets really bad and then Mulder's supposed suicide at the end where it's said by scully that Mulder killed himself and was a victim of a larger conspiracy and believing that aliens were a real thing which granted me watching this after the show has ended doesn't work in the show's favor but never bought it and then season six is my favorite season of the show because most of my favorite episodes are in this season the alien meeting with the syndicate about a trade and then eventually learning of the alien invasion preparing for the attack with alien human hybrids spender betrays his own father and gets killed driver walter white the bermuda triangle had a lot of care put into it the two dreamland freaky friday episodes were a lot of fun and great the suicide pack christmas episode bruce campbell wanting a normal kid the old ass dude that wanted to see death the time loop episode the nice suburban episode the alien that loved baseball and then the giant mushroom all these episodes were really damn good and then getting rid of the syndicate as a whole was sort of like now what i guess now the smoky man is the one and true villain of the entire series now 
And that was every X-Files episode ranked from what I thought was the worst to the best. Overall, I enjoy my time with it. I didn't go in thinking it was going to be the best show ever. There's 11 seasons and there's no way a show with 11 seasons can be consistently good for that long. Like I said somewhere in the video, over time I started to care more about the one-off episodes and for Mulder and Scully's banter. The whole I don't believe and I want to believe between them was a lot of fun. But it did get ridiculous when Scully saw an alien in a tube or a spirit and was still like, nah, I don't believe it. What was it going to take to convince her that these things exist? It's not like I didn't care about the alien stuff, but by the end of season 2 or 3, a lot of it was probably going to be unsolved because that's just some of the way, if not all the episodes, end. In order to keep Scully a skeptic and Mulder continue searching for the truth, Skinner was a great addition to the show. I don't mind Daga or Reyes, just kind of wish they got their own season rather than having Mulder and Scully be along with them. The Smoky Man is the best character on the show despite me getting tired of him in the later seasons. He was easily the most interesting part of the show, and the show never truly got completely awful. There were just some frustrating decisions on keeping Mulder and Scully on the show when they could have been written off and having some redundant things that repeat. It stayed consistent for seven seasons until the quality went down, which is usually how much material you have for a show until you repeat storylines and go off the rails. So yeah, I think I would recommend this show to people, but 11 seasons is a lot and you're gonna have to commit to watching it for months. It's still a good show.